um, at the University of Michigan. I was at Michigan Tech. And, um, and there I uh, got a degree in engineering mechanics, uh, which, uh, you know, really um, even further fostered my love of mechanics. And, um, and, and of course, uh, doing my you know, undergrad in chemical engineering, I learned a lot about chemistry. And so when, I, when it was time to look for PhD um, options, I, I discovered this really amazing um, professor who just started at Max Planck in Stuttgart, Ho Jiang Gao, who, who you all know, of course. And he just had moved to Germany at the time. And he was interested in, and I think his group was called um, Theory of Mesoscopic Phenomena, which sounded really amazing and interesting. And so I, you know, I met him, met the people in his lab, and, and you know, they were really interested in, um, you know, in, in doing nano, nanoscience, um, and actually applying nanoscience and molecular simulation to, um, to mechanics, nanomechanics. Um, and so forth, and, and so bio application as well. And so that's how I got into that. And for my PhD, I worked, as you all know, worked on fracture, um, thin films, metals, MD simulations, and, and other things like that. And I, I then, um, for my postdoc, I then decided I, I really needed to learn more about chemistry again, right? So that, um, that's what led me to work with Bill Goddard at Caltech, and I, you know, spent some time with him. And um, and then I, I ended up um, at MIT. Um, you know, a couple years later, which, which is where I'm now. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I actually, I would say I, you know, during my PhD, I, I really, I really um, focused in on materials science. That's what I consider my home discipline really. Um, of course, mechanics, mechanics and materials in the context of material science, but um, th that, that became my main, um, my main interest. And it's, it's an exciting field because it's, it's very broad, um, you know, it involves, if you're a modeler, you can do math, um, you can work with abstractions. I, I've become, as, as you, as some of you know, in the last couple of years, and I'll show today, um, we've become more and more interested in experimental work as well at, in the lab. And, um, actually when you, when you were in the lab, Grace, um, I think you were one of the, one of the students who who started experimental work after you know Leon did some initial work, Leon Dumas, you remember him. And, um, and so since then we actually expanded that significantly. We have um, um, a whole bunch of living organisms, spiders, which I'll, I'll show later in the talk. Um, we have um, of course a lot of pre printing going on. We have a, a lab, a BL2 lab um, for biomass processing. So we became you know, really interested in, I, I became really interested in, um, in using the theory, the simulation, the mathematics, um, you know, the mechanics of, of really building models to also test them. And um, we're very collaborative. We have a lot of collaboration with experimental labs, but some of the things we, we want to do on our own or, or have unique capabilities in our labs, so we've built that up. And so, yeah, so that's my, my journey in a, in a really, really brief kind of summary. But uh, and I, uh, yeah, I have a question. Did you grow up in the United States or in Germany? No, I grew up in um, near Stuttgart. And I think I met you probably when I was a PhD student in Stuttgart, maybe at the time. But yeah, so I grew up in a town near Stuttgart, and um, and um, but I did spend you know a little bit of time as a high school student in Arkansas, um, yeah. and um, and then later then later on, and like I mentioned in Michigan, and then I you know lived in California for a while and in Massachusetts. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Germany. So you got your uh, high school in yeah. Germany, right. and then. College in United States in Michigan. No, I went to, no, I went to um, um, a college in Germany too for undergrad, and then I then I moved to um, to Michigan for a master's degree, and oh, then see. back to you know back to actually Stuttgart, but a different place at Max Planck Institute. But um, you know my uh, my the Max Planck Institutes don't actually give degrees, and so my degree is from the University of Stuttgart. Um, yeah, right, right, right. That they have there. Right, okay. yeah, you know the, you know the, the, the way it works, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so I, um, I grew up there, and uh, most of my family still live. Actually, all my family still lives in Germany. Um, um, my one of my brothers lives in um, still near Stuttgart, the other one in Berlin. So spider. Uh, so at one point, I saw you started to work on. Um, this uh, silk uh, in collaboration with uh, somebody who actually make these things. Mm -hmm. so how, how did that start? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, when I first was at MIT, I, um, you know, really shifted my, my interests when I started there, built my own lab on, on protein materials. That was, that became my, you know, my main mission for my lab. And, 
Um, protein materials, especially the mechanics of proteins, um, was a field that um, you know, it was quite quite new in mechanics and material science at the time. Um, still is actually, I think, a, a smaller field, but even though the materials are really important, as I'll show today. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, my first years in, on the faculty, I spent really on doing, um, you know, modeling and theory only. And I, I used a lot of existing data from the literature to validate the models or the test yeah. predictions. But as the predictions became, I would say, more, um, you know, more, more, more Bit bigger and and more and, and many more. I, I needed uh, I needed to test them, um, and there weren't experiments available anymore at some point. And so I, I had always um, had um, you know great affinity for David Kaplan. I think is the individual. Yeah, right. I work with many other people, but David I think is what yeah one of the people I work very closely with. And you know David is um, you know an amazing researcher, um, an amazing um, 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 really protein scientist who who makes proteins and his. His lab is also interested in silk, of course, and also in, in other proteins, but his specialty is how do we make proteins um, either using the insects or bacteria or yeast or um, synthetic biology or the various methods or, or, or chemical methods. And that was a great fit. So I, you know, once I, I don't remember actually what year it was, but at some point we, we met, I, I, I think I actually invited him to give talks and I also organized a symposium with the MRS ones and I, I you know, got involved with him and I, anyway, we, we realized we have a lot of complementary strengths. And that was really uh, critical for me as a young faculty that to have someone who, you know, is, is, is not, a, not someone who works in exactly the same field, but is complementary. And so he was someone who, who, you know, didn't have a lot of modeling activity in his lab, but had a lot of experimental synthesis capabilities. I had a lot of predictions and I wanted to improve my models. And I also wanted to make models that the biomedical community cares about. And, now was sort of a, a great match, and we still work together. We've worked together for many years now. Um, have uh, joint funding through the NIH, um, and um, have a lot of shared students and postdocs. Um, and Wonderful. since we're close, I mean, yeah, Tufts and MIT, we have um, um, monthly group meetings for both of our groups once a month, and we we alternate locations. Right, right now, it's not happening in, in person, of course. We're doing a meetings um, on Zoom. Uh, pretty much, but um, but yeah, usually we 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 go to each other's labs, um, spend time there, meet once a month as a whole group, and and that's been you know I would say I mean Grace actually knows this because she was in some of those meetings, you know, has been really um you know key thing because you know meeting in person is different than meeting on phone right or on Zoom or WebEx before or, or Skype, um, and it, it also for the students for the modeling students to be able to go to the lab and see okay how do you make a protein that you've designed how long does it take. Well, it's not just hitting a button, right? It's, it takes months of preparation. So that gives the, um, the modeling people a lot of motivation and understanding, appreciation for what their value actually is because we're, 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 we're helping the experimentalists to make only five proteins instead of making 500, right? And if, on the other side, the, uh, the experimental um, folks have appreciation of how the modeling is done. Um, they can tell us you know, what they're looking for, um, and they also can learn about modeling. And a lot of them are chemists, of course, they know a lot about chemistry, so they have a really easy access to this. But yeah, so we have, um, like I said, shared students that learn modeling. I have students and postdocs that learn experimental work. And, and since we have a lab now at MIT, we can do some of the experiments there as well. And, and so, so I think it's been very exciting um, to, to work yeah, with. Is, you're, you're, you have an unbelievable capacity for work. So I don't know if we're going to grace, we'll, we'll talk about it. You're also department head in civil engineering department. Right, yeah. And well, uh, down, civil actually. engineering, their yeah. intersection probably is zero, maybe not exactly zero. Right. How, how do you man manage that? Well, first of all, I want to announce, I mean, not, most of you know that already. I'm actually, I'm, I'm finishing my term as department head in about two weeks. So I'm very excited about that, that new chapter, but- no, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I've been, yeah it has uh, been ten years, five years, uh, seven years, seven years. Oh, seven years. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, I think the um, you know, as the department head, I um, I you know, my main you know goal was really to help uh, the department grow, and um, and actually, I think a lot of the work we do in in looking at bio inspired materials is is really has a really interesting connection to environmental engineering and uh, you know with sustainability. And I think actually, I think Tang actually you gave a. Um, a lecture along those lines, right? So, so there's a connection there. Um, um, you know, in thinking about materials as a solution to you know a lot of um, you know challenges in energy and sustainability, and I think 
looking to nature actually is is a very powerful paradigm and, you know because nature has the very efficient ways of dealing with waste and um and creating function and, and so forth so so that was the you know that was the framework um there but yeah I've, I've enjoyed that um but i'm also really looking forward to having a lot more time to spend with my students and you know giving talks traveling um and, and so forth so marcus Solin here and uh, many years back, I heard that you, uh, you and a guy from, uh, you know, uh, have won a NIH, a NIH grant. I was wondering how your work uh, make impact in medicine. I want to learn from you on this. Well, well yeah. So I'll, I'll show a little bit of that today. But um, well, the so the work with Guy, I, I won't show. Too many things of that work today. I, I didn't talk a lot about collagen and bone, but the work with, with Guy and, and 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 the team around around him, and we actually just um, uh, you know launching a new a new a new grant actually with him and his group, uh, you know deals with um, with the miners in collagen. Um, and collagen is um, and again I won't really talk too much about collagen today, but it's it's nature's main structural building material. It makes bones, tendon, uh, it's in our skin um, and, and so forth. And and that has a lot of medical implications because there are many diseases where collagen is, is damaged or you know, mutated or not grown correctly. And anything from brittle, brittle bone disease, which actually is something I first heard about when I was with Ho Jang Gao, as he had, he had an interest in brittle bone disease, as you might remember, some of you might remember those, those papers. Um, so yeah, so that there's a lot of um, diseases associated with the mechanics of stuff in our body, right? And, and that's one aspect. And um, as, as you'll hear later, uh, we were very interested in protein design and, and mutations and how we can make proteins functional um, based on the, on the design principles. So that is really important for medicine as well. So if the, the one problem is of course, if the design goes wrong, like if you have a mutation or the protein are built correctly, the tissue doesn't work anymore. And mechanics is really critical for pretty much anything in our body because our body is a mechanical object. So, so we have, um, there's a lot of mechanics that's relevant, um, and, um, and actually some of those things I learned from Jimmy in his in his program at the NSF and his oh. position, you know, in connecting bio, nano, and um, and mechanics. But um, but the the other the other aspect is, and that's what I'm I'm very heavily, very heavily involved with both Guy and David is um, the you know the idea that you, you want to create new tissues or synthetic tissues, right? So if you have a, a platform like silk or collagen or, or other proteins, uh, we might be interested in you know, creating uh, a new a replacement material right, for, for the human body. And, and that replacement material has to be coded in an appropriate way. So you can't just put a piece of plastic in the body. It, you can, but it doesn't work too well. But if you use the same building blocks as nature does to build um, skin or blood vessels or nerve tissue or bone tissue, uh, you can have cells interact you know, in, in, in the way they want to, they should with, with, these, with these materials. So that's the, the angle. So I think, you know, for us, that, um, that is something we do. And a lot of the grants we have with NIH, they deal with um, uh, some, you know, either animal or even human experiments, potentially. Uh, we don't do those. So those are done by my collaborators. So they have the medical, either are in the medical school or they, they have the facilities for this. Um, but yeah, there is, um, you know, I think in, in medicine, a great need for quantitative models and predictive models and designer materials. Right? So a lot of the materials are tweaked, right? You, you, you begin with some tissue or some polymer and you kind of evolve it, you know, randomly or trial and error. And, you know, what we bring to the table is, um, you know, some more, more quantitative predictions. And there's a whole group, as I think you were one of these meetings, the IMAC group at, um, at NIH with Grace Jang and others, um, which were just going pretty well. And, and that group is actually dedicated, as, as you know, to multi-scale modeling in, in biomedical engineering and medicine. And so, so they're beginning to get into the, uh, the, you know, the field. And I wanna actually tell a little anecdote. When I, when I started at MIT, I mentioned I began to get involved with proteins and protein materials. And I remember going to uh, some of the Gordon conferences in the field and you know, I was the only modeler, right? So I remember going to the Elastin Gordon conference and uh, actually, Tony Weiss uh, is also a collaborator of mine. I think he invited me to one of these. And, um, you know, and, and I was the only guy doing modeling and everyone else was doing experimental work. And, and, and that has changed actually. So you know, since going there in probably 2006 or eight or something uh, to now, um, there are a lot more people doing modeling. And there's sort of, there's definitely a lot more 
um, openness in the medical community to do um, quantitative modeling, molecular dynamics, um, and, and you know predictive predictive design of material. So so that's been a, a big shift. I mean, thanks to I think our community and um, what, what we have done as a, as a group here. Great, thank you so much, Marcus. Um, um, if, if, if there's more questions, perhaps we can wait after, after the talk. Is that all right? Can I have a question? Uh, uh, Marcus, this is Tian from University of Alberta. And I have been really admiring your interdisciplinary work. I talk to my students about your work that bridges uh, mechanics and music. If you remember your publications on, you know, connecting the proteins with, uh, I, I remember your co-authors were uh, musicians and, and, and dance directors or uh, so, so I'm, I'm just wondering how, how did you, how did you start doing the work that connects yeah. such different fields? Right. Yeah. So actually it's a great segue to the talk because I'll, I'll be covering some of those things. I actually got to talk about the, the mechanics of music. So um, I, I think I'll answer that, but, um, but, you know, I want to say that, I mean, I've, I've always been really, really interested in, um, in connecting different fields. Actually, that's what really got me into science really in the first place I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I, I've always uh, you know, try to find ways to, to explain, understand the world and how it works. And, you know, one way to understanding things is to find differences and commonalities, right? And so you can begin to, um, you know, kind of look at the world and see, you know, where the similarities, and you begin to see actually that in the, you know, in the, in the construction of materials and especially biological materials and the construction of what humans create as language or art or music, as you mentioned, they're sort of um, on the surface. You can see a lot of a lot of really intricate interactions. Now, since then, since we kind of like looked at that um, conceptually, um, I think this was in 2009, 10, 11. Actually, Steve, I see Steve here, at least on my screen. Um, Steve Cranford and I, we wrote a book together, and there's a, this chapter is in there already. And but so since then, we um, we have used uh, a lot more, more rigorous methods, um, you know, including categorization, category theory, and more recently, and that's the word you're referring to, and that's what I'll talk about today a little bit, um, to, to really build a you know, very vigorous connection between the mechanics of molecules and, and tissues and filaments and, and, and other manifestations like music and things you can hear and see. So, so that has been something that is really interesting because you know, to me, when you're an engineer um, and you wanna create something, you wanna design something, and how do you design? Well, you, you draw something usually, right? So to me in the future, um, our mind, our brain, I mean, as long as we're still using our brain, <laughs> we're not replacing it. Um, we, um, the human creativity is very powerful. And I, and I think if we can explore other ways of utilizing the human brain in a way it works really well. Um, oh yeah, thanks Steve for posting the book. Yeah, the sales are down a little bit, but um, maybe that webinar will help. No, I'm just kidding, you can. Um, but um, yeah, so when you when you have um, um, access to other design methods, you know, actually potentially creating um, materials not through making a drawing, but actually creating sound or tones, um, you can explore that. And you can also put uh, other people to work that don't usually design materials, right? So you know, I'll, I'll show later. Um, there's some really interesting uh, work we're doing in, in seeing what kind of proteins might Beethoven or Bach have invented um, by you know kind of mirroring the human physical um, the physical realization of the human brain on into music and there's a lot of interesting things that they have discovered um, through that uh, methodology without ever actually knowing maybe about math actually Bach probably knew about math more but but you hey, know Marcus, but, yes Marcus can we ask you to um, start your uh, sharing your slides and Grace yes. please take her over all right yeah, thank you so much for all the questions. I think that we will have time for questions after the talk as well. Um, and I will get started. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, the EML webinar today. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Marcus Bueller. Um, I will uh, give a short bio. Uh, professor Marcus Bueller is currently the McAfee Professor of Engineering at MIT and leads MIT's Laboratory for Atomistic and Molecular Mechanics. His primary research interests focus on the structure and mechanical properties of biological and bio-inspired materials to characterize, model, and create materials with architectural features from the nano to the macro scale. 
His most recent book, uh, Biomaterialomics, presents a new design paradigm for the analysis of biomaterials using a categorization approach that translates insights from disparate fields, such as materials and music. Uh, Professor Bueller is a recipient of many awards, including the Harold E. Edgerton Faculty Achievement Award, the Alfred uh, Nobel Prize, the Feynman Prize in Nanotechnology, the Leonardo da Vinci Award, and the Thomas uh, Hughes Young, Young Investigator Award. He's also the recipient of the NSF Career Award, uh, uh, many uh, Air Force Awards, and uh, D, the DARPA Young, Young Faculty Award, as well as the PKS Award. In 2018, Bueller, uh, Professor Bueller was selected as a highly cited researcher by Clarivate Analytics. In 2019, he received the Materials Horizons Outstanding Paper Prize, and his work was recognized as a highly cited author by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, uh, Professor Bueller, we look forward to your talk. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Grace, for the introduction. And um, you have actually, while you were talking in the background, um, you can see this, this little piece of a spider web, which I'll, I'll talk much more about in, a, in a, during, during the lecture. But I'm excited to share with you, um, you know, some of the work we've been doing in, um, in recent years on, uh, we call it mechanics of biomaterialics. And, you know, this is really work that, um, you know, we have done here at MIT with my students um, and a couple of collaborators, including Tomas Saracino, David Kaplan, who we talked about already earlier, uh, Tony Weiss, I mentioned him, and many others. We are, um, have been very collaborative and very lucky to have really amazing uh, friends and collaborators in the society over the years. And I do hope that maybe we'll um, spin up a couple of new collaborations after this uh, talk today. So maybe um, there's some opportunities that arise. Um, I want to say a big thank you to my lab. Um, this is a picture, um, I think we took that picture last summer, one on the, on the bottom. And uh, since then, we had a lot of new students actually join the lab. Um, some who either weren't here at that, at that picture taking or some that are new and they're all in the top here as I photoshopped them in. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to the students. Although the work I showed today, of course, is, is really work done by the students um, over the last, um, actually, I think it goes back 10, 10, or 10 or so, 10 plus years. I'll try to give you a little bit of historical perspective of the work we've done. So what, what we're interested in is um, we're interested in the, um, the engineering design of all scales. And if you think about materials uh, conventionally, you um, sort of you know, look at them uh, at the macro scale. Uh, this is the Eiffel Tower. Um, even the Eiffel Tower has what we call hierarchical design. When you go take a little closer look, you can see trusses in there. Uh, shapes, you can see the trusses are made from even smaller trusses, and they ultimately they're made from I-beams and other kind of geometrical features. Now, if you go even further into the details of these the systems, you're going to find that there's, um, there's, there's uh, nano, um, microstructures and nanostructures, and ultimately molecules, and at the very, very basic level, we have atoms. And you know, the work in my lab really is, is trying to integrate these different scales and trying to come up with models and predictions and design solutions that allow us to tune all these knobs at the same time. And that is something that nature does really well. So if we can organize and arrange and design the structure at all these different levels, uh, we have an opportunity to design better materials, uh, you know, lighter materials, stronger materials. And actually, as I'll show, materials from unusual uh, building blocks, um, like waste um, or organic raw materials or proteins that you know, we in engineering today aren't using yet. So, um, you know, what gets us excited are biological systems um, because they offer, you know, very interesting design solutions or insights. Um, a lot of times we work with spider webs. This is a two dimensional orb web, which you've all seen. Um, and um, other kinds of things we're looking at are um, materials like uh, muscle adhesion um, pads or um, these threads in muscles, which have a very different function. They're glues, basically, uh, they're underwater glues. Uh, we have other materials like um, these are intermediate filaments in cells, which form a mechanical network to provide mechanical integrity to cells and a very large deformation. And uh, other kind of biomaterials you might be looking at are nerve cells. So these have yet other functions. So these actually are sort of the fundamental basic building block of the of the brain um, and, and neurons and other kinds of systems like this. And what what the point of these examples is that all of these materials you've seen. Um, are, are really based on a very different in terms of their functions, right? You can appreciate the spider web has very different function um, than the nerve cells, but they're all made from the same um, chemical building blocks. And these are ultimately proteins or proteins actually are made from amino acids. And there's uh, 20 naturally occurring amino acids, which are you know, basically 20 letters in an, in an alphabet, if you wish. 
And these, um, these uh, letters uh, form um, the, the basic language by which nature builds life. And so these uh, protein materials are you know, incredibly interesting from a materials perspective, because as a material scientist, I'm interested in relating the structure of the microstructure to function. And if you have a, um, a, um, a building block um, pool or, or basically Lego bricks that are these 20 uh, unique amino acids, and you can achieve all these different functions that life needs, um, that is a really big challenge as an engineer to first understand and then create new materials and new machinery uh, that provide um, functions. And we're especially interested, of course, in mechanical functions. So a lot of the talk today will be about mechanics, um, mechanics, uh, mechanical properties, but also the mechanics of how function emerges in, in these materials. So as you look at these uh, biological materials, uh, you're going you're gonna to ask the question, you know, how do they become so interesting? Why are they interesting? Well, the answer is that um, you know, materials like silk are, are extremely um, high performing. For instance, mm -hmm. silk has a strength of uh, about a gigapascal, which is the strength you have in some steels. Um, you have uh, you know, a, a, a toughness of um, you know, levels that are far exceeding steel. Um, you have um, fail of, failure strains of 60 or 100 percent. And, uh, and yet these materials, unlike steel or, or polymers, usually are made at room temperature. So these actually are self-assembled materials that are made you know, by the spider in its body um, you know, very quickly. So you've all seen the spider make a, make a silk filament and, um, and that happens really you know, very rapidly on demand. And so these spiders are amazing uh, autonomous 3D printers that can sort of sense their world and, and create new structures from that. And the, the reason why these spider webs and, and other materials like that are, are such high performing materials is because they have these hierarchical structures. So in the beginning, I mentioned the biomaterialics outline of having multiple levels. And in fact, so these materials are all built based on this paradigm that nature uses commonly to create function. Uh, we begin by um, the proteins, which are encoded with the amino acid sequence, which is in turn encoded by DNA. We have uh, sort of um, secondary structures, uh, microstructures, mesoscale structures. In the case of silk, we have filaments, microfilaments, bundles of filaments, and ultimately a web. And you know, all these different scales interact and provide collectively a function that we're interested in studying. So it's really important for these uh, materials to, um, to function in a biological setting um, very reliably. And so that provides uh, you know, a lot of really interesting insights for engineers. The other um, constraint that of course many biological materials have is that they need to use resources um, very scarcely. Um, you know, insects like spiders or the human body uh, doesn't have a lot of different resources available. I mean, it's the concept of energy. Um, and waste, and, and um, that provides an angle, as I mentioned earlier, to some of the environmental sustainability challenges that the world is facing today. Um, how are these materials made? And that's you know, another really interesting direction that my lab has gotten interested recently is um, you know, they're really encoded by the DNA. Um, DNA is really just a um, hard drive, basically, to store information of how the materials are built. Uh, but the actual physical manifestation of materials is achieved through um, proteins and other materials, uh, other, other biological building blocks, but, but proteins are, are key, a key workhorse, especially in creating functional diversity. Um, these proteins are made uh, by cells. Uh, they're usually self-assembled. And uh, a lot of times they are assembled using additional machinery like the spinning duct. So what you see on the right-hand side actually is a, a spinning duct of a, of a, of a spider um, of, of a spider that, um, that produces these, uh, these microfilaments, which then integrate and connect to form the fibers you see in the spider web. So it's a pretty complex process. And in you know, some of the work with David Kaplan and his lab, we have actually um, mimicked this process and created synthetic analogs of making silk, making these silk fibers synthetically really in the lab from scratch so we don't need the spiders. So once you, um, you know, get involved in, in silk and related materials um, and you begin to understand them, and I'll, I'll spend a quite a little work, uh, quite, quite a lot of time today in the talk to, to explain to you, you know, how we understand these materials systematically. But, but once you do, um, uh, what, what can you do with it? Right? What's the impact of this work? And uh, one thing you can do, you can then recreate materials. You can change the materials. So you're not relying on just the materials that nature makes, like a spider web or um, or cocoons like shown here, but you can make your own versions of the silk. Uh, you can either use uh, existing ingredients like the silk cocoons and re reconstitute the building blocks, or you can make the proteins from scratch using bacteria or yeast or other kinds of organisms uh, or synthetic biology. 
and you can put them together in different forms and shapes. So like we've made uh, silk meshes for filtration, tissue engineering, we've made uh, nano springs from silk, we've made very strong silk. Um, and you know what you can do is, as an engineer, you can begin to go beyond what nature has invented here um, and, and make materials like this. So um, let me talk a little bit about some of the mechanical features of um, in the beginning here of a spider web. And, and you know, this, this is work that um, actually Steve is on the, on the, on, on the, I think on the panel um, and Anna, I think is gonna join in, in a few moments. Uh, Steve and Anna were uh, two of the key authors of this, of this nature paper we had a couple of years ago. We have, uh, I think for the first time really provided an integrated look at the mechanics of a web at the macro scale and connecting these macroscopic features of the web uh, to the nanoscale. And the way we, we, we can understand that is really through a series of studies and series of investigations at different scales to understand how the uh, DNA sequence that defines the silk proteins. Um, and again, as I mentioned, these uh, proteins assemble through this micro microfluidic device that the spider has in its spinning duct. Um, they form a nanostructure. And the nanostructure is something that you know, features combinations of, of two building blocks in this case, of a beta sheet nanocrystal, which are very stiff building blocks, and um, a, a helical structure or an amorphous structure, which is unstructured, um, as the name indicates, which is very soft. And so you have these, uh, these two building blocks, one being very stiff, one being very soft, and they, they form a composite and you can pattern them differently. And the spider is able to, in, through the spinning process, to create a composite filament network that features um, this uh, play on these themes of connecting stiff and soft materials, which when you put them together in these filaments, um, uh, we have shown using molecular simulations provide these highly nonlinear considered behavior, typically in spider silk leading to the stiffening behavior. You can kind of see that here, right? So you can see how the, uh, the stress strain or force extension curve uh, increases as the filaments align and as the loading actually is transferred more and more to the beta sheet structures, which are the very stiff components of the system. Then that these, um, these filaments with that considered behavior form the web structure and we've shown that these webs are highly resilient against deformation and failure. In fact, when you try to break the web, um, usually failure is localized to individual threads. And so when you pull on the threads, you don't damage the entire web. In fact, you actually damage it locally only. And that deformation field, you can think about then mapping that again on the nanoscale to ask the question, what kind of molecular mechanisms actually occur in different regions of the web? And that again leads us to you know, a, a, a plot or a field um, that describes the molecular deformation state over the entire web. And that nano to macro, macro to nano connection is very powerful. So I'll talk more about the detailed models within this approach uh, in, in a moment, but I wanna spend uh, just two slides to talk to you about the, the kind of methods we use to actually study these systems in that way. So experimentally- um, hey, Marcus, actually, Yes? Marcus Shigang here, can you use your cursor? Oh, yeah, sorry, I, um, I was <laughs> actually, I was actually, here we go. The, does this work? Yeah. Um, I, had, um, I had the wrong um, pointer. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, all right. So let me, let me go. Uh, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I was actually curious why I, didn't, why I didn't see it. And then I realized, as you were asking, that I used the wrong one. So now I have the right one. Good. So um, th thank, thank you, Tiang. So, so this is the picture. And you know, I want to talk a little about the methods we use. One of the methods is molecular simulation, which provides you know, a very powerful way of describing the, the, the structure, the formation, the assembly of molecules. And then what you see here actually is it's a protein folding simulation. I think actually this simulation is done by Sinan Keaton, former student in the lab, um, who uh, is now at Northwestern. I don't know if he's on, on the, uh, in the audience, but um, he, did, he made that movie. And, and that sort of um, movie shows um, the, the self-assembly of a protein. And, the reason why this protein folds into this beta sheet structure is because of the sequence. So it has a memory of what it's supposed to look like in equilibrium. And uh, we can actually engineer the structure by changing the sequence. So that's one aspect is sort of using uh, folding simulations. The other one, once we have created a model of a protein, uh, we can break it. And that's one of my favorite uh, things to do as uh, all of the students and everyone knows that I like to break things and fracture things and understand how they, how they perform under extreme conditions. And so what you see here, is a simulation. This simulation actually was done by Max Solar, a former uh, PhD student in the lab. Uh, and Max, you know, took that that is an amyloid protein and pulled it apart, and, and we studied the fracturing process there. Uh, here's another simulation that Sinan did a couple of years ago of a different protein. Um, this is a titan muscle protein, uh, and he pulled it apart. And, and, and the reason why I show this is you can see these blue dotted lines in there. 
Uh, these are the hydrogen bonds. These are the kinds of interaction chemically that actually drive the folding of a protein are to some extent or to a large extent uh, a very weak chemical bond that we call hydrogen bonding. And these hydrogen bonds actually define the, the structure that forms together with a couple of other chemical forces like hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, charge interactions, and to some extent covalent bonding. But the, uh, the most the dominating features in protein folding are weak interactions, uh, which means that proteins can actually change their shape. Um, uh, either uh, they can be tuned by nature, by the living organisms, so these materials are usually tunable, or they can be tuned by mechanical deformation. And so what this study here shows, this is work I've done with uh, Zhao Jin, former student um, who, um, who just graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, Zhao has um, you know, done the, these uh, simulations where we, we pulled um, alpha helical proteins, which are these, uh, we'll call these building blocks that are very soft in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the silicon nanostructure. These um, alpha helical proteins, when you pull them, um, uh, unfold very easily because the hydrogen bonds are arranged in clusters, but they're not arranged in series, and the density is fairly low. And so when you pull them, they break one by one in series. And so what you get as a mechanical signature is a very flat curve. So you have um, sort of a very tough material, but, but very extensible material. I I'll show you the force extension curve on the next slide. But what's interesting is if you have a bunch of these alpha helices and you put them together in a, in a larger system, when you increase the critical dimension in the, in the x direction, the x direction being the length of the helices, um, you see a phenomenon what's called, um, is seen in panel B, which is called an alpha beta transition. And, and you can see this here that now these alpha helices actually, um, these proteins change their shape and they organize their nanostructure, their microstructure differently, and they actually form um, a, a very different organization of, 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 of the protein molecules, in this case now as a beta sheet. Now, beta sheets have many of uh, these hydrogen bonds ranged in, in parallel. And uh, when you pull these, uh, they turn, tend to be much stiffer, much stronger materials, much more brittle materials. So this um, study you know, actually looked at the size effect related to um, critical dimensionalities of how this alpha beta transition happens molecularly. But from a mechanics perspective, it's very interesting because it shows that it shows how the mechanical signature, in this case, force over strain, is you know, strongly affected by these by these particular nanostructures and defined in the protein. Like right? so, an alpha helix is this this gray line here, a very soft material, very extensible. The beta sheet, once they form, have a very stiff, very rigid mechanical signature. And in a in a material like silk. You have both in there. You you have no transition necessarily, but you have alpha helices and amorphous proteins, and you have beta sheets, and they form the building blocks out of which we can make a composite. Okay, so the strength of silk actually is really determined by these strong beta sheet structures. And so we spend a great deal of time uh, over the years in studying beta sheets, which are you know extremely interesting protein classes, uh, not only for the mechanics because they determine how strong silk can be. But they're also really interesting medically. So, um, um, you know, we, Sunan was asking earlier about the medical development. So, these proteins, these um, beta sheet rich proteins, um, are found in, in many diseases like prion diseases, amyloid diseases, which are from Alzheimer's disease, for instance, and in a couple other, um, other uh, newer de de degenerative diseases. Um, so, there's a lot of medical development for these. And the reason why they're medically relevant is because these beta sheets tend to be so stiff and so strong that they exceed uh, the normal behavior, if you wish, of many other proteins in the human body. Now in silk, of course, they utilize it deliberately. And uh, what's interesting from a mechanics perspective is actually that we can understand size effects. So I already mentioned that, you know, the more um, the, the individual hydrogen bond is a very weak bond. In fact, uh, you want to know the mechanics of a single hydrogen bond, you can think of water, right? Water is a liquid. And if you have a, you have a liquid has uh, basically no shear strength, at least at, at longer time scales. And so when you take a protein and you make individual hydrogen bonds, you have no strength. But if you take a bunch of these hydrogen bonds and you group them in clusters um, around three to four to five, um, you actually exceed, uh, you actually maximize the strength. And so that's sort of that one dimension of, this, of the scaling is how many hydrogen bonds you can group in a cluster in a beta sheet on alpha helix. Um, and the other dimension, of course, in silk is the size of these crystals. That's what's studied on this slide here. So you can stack, uh, in this case, seven of these um, beta, beta strands, or you can st stack, I think these are probably 10 or 15 of these here. And it turns out that if you exceed a critical dimensionality here, the, um, the behavior of this stack of beta sheets now, it becomes very distinct. And this is a paper we published in Nature Materials with Sinan and uh, actually a couple of undergrad students who participated in that. Um, in, in, in that work. 
And what this work has shown is that if you make uh, stacks that are very small up to a critical dimensionality of a couple of nanometers um, on the scale of two to four nanometers, um, the deformation, if you sort of do a pull out experiments, you, you, you fix the top and the bottom, you pull the middle, um, these, uh, these, uh, these sheets um, fail under a stick slip motion. Because hydrogen bonds are weak, they can reform. I, I already showed earlier how alpha helices can turn into beta sheets. Here we have beta sheets that can themselves change their shape and they don't break right away. They actually can self-heal because the bonds can reform very easily. Now, if you have very large um, stacks, um, the kind of deformation you see is no longer a stick slip motion. In fact, this behaves like a high aspect ratio beam. And we actually use continuum theory, continuum uh, mechanics theory to, to, to illustrate to understand this problem. And of course, in this case, you have tension on the outside, compression on the inside. And uh, these tension and compression loading conditions on these hydrogen bonds um, take away the ability of, of hydrogen bonds to act cooperatively, right? So we need cooperativity to go from a single bond strength to a higher bond strength. Uh, this goes away uh, once you have this, uh, this strong gradient of compression to, to tension and the other way around in this case. And so this crystal actually is no longer resilient. It's very brittle, right? And so you get this transition and this sort of led us to uh, you know, create a, 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 a map of, of critical length scales for these uh, beta sheet crystals. Again, we go from a single bond. Um, we need a, a certain dimensionality uh, to achieve strength. We need a certain confinement of, of these individual hydrogen bonds. And then we need to stack them. Now you might ask, why do we need to build crystals of beta sheets, right? Why, why, do, why is it not enough to have a single strand? The reason are the crosslinks. So the way silk creates crosslinks and higher crosslink density, of course, leads to better mechanical properties is that every single polypeptide needs to connect to one another. And every time you want to connect one, you have to add a leather layer to these beta sheet crystals. And you pay a price for that, as I've shown earlier, and it's actually shown here as well. So if you make these stacks too big, if you add too many crosslinks, the crosslink itself becomes weak. And then, of course, the material integrity uh, is reduced, and so you don't have a strong material. And so this uh, interplay of dimensions is something very powerful, which actually directly translates to the mechanical signature of silk at the macro scale uh, through these scales. And so this, um, these uh, strong crosslinks and the molecular basis to this is what we used in building this model here. And this is not, this is what the Steve, um, Steve and Anna, where we, uh, we looked at the, the native silk, which basically you've seen that already is this uh, stiffening behavior of the silk filament. And we created webs of that and we modeled the web. We did experiments in the web as well. We pulled it, we broke it. And we found that damage is highly localized. And um, this uh, localization is, of course, a big advantage for the spider because the spider doesn't want to repair a big part of the web when it breaks. Right? Let's say a fly flies into the web, or there's a, a rock falling in debris or wind loading. Um, the, the web needs to be protected, and the spider will repair the web, but it doesn't want to repair the whole web. So damage is localized. And this actually is achieved by this stiffening behavior. And so if you think about uh, stiffening behavior leads to a stronger stuff concentration in a, in a continuum, and that same applies here as well. And we've tested this by creating a hypothetical web uh, that is made from silks that don't exist in nature that are elastic plastic or very softening, uh, have a strong softening behavior. And these softening behaviors actually lead to webs that have a much larger damage zone. So once you have larger damage zones, um, of course, when a rock flies in or, or, um, or there's damage induced on the web, the damage is much more widespread in a geometrical sense. So this is bad for the web, but actually, and, and on, as a counter example for what nature does, so this interplay of stiff and soft leads to this behavior of the stiffening. But in other materials like composites, we actually want that. And this is actually worked by, uh, done by Grace uh, and others in the lab, where we have looked at composites and using stiff and soft building blocks to optimize them to create um, very large damage zones for high toughness of composites. And that's what you want in a composite, right? So in a composite, you don't want local damage, you want spread the damage so you have high toughness. And, and you can see that actually here, this is an experimental picture. I think Leon took that in the lab where we showed that if you have a, a homogeneous material, you have a high stress concentration, very local damage. Once you engineer these microstructures to distribute loading and damage across the domain, you get damage in a very large region, which is in turn leads to high toughness. And that's what Grace has shown here in the optimization approach. Um, very high toughness, very high strength materials can be designed in that way. And of course, uh, materials like nacre and seashells and many others uh, in nature and teeth and bones, uh, you know, actually use this paradigm. So the reason why I showed these ex these examples is, um, you know, one of the powerful paradigms we've been researching in the lab is what we call UDP. Uh, UDP stands for Universality Diversity Paradigm, and 
the pattern that nature uses is it creates diversity of functions, sort of different properties out of a universality building blocks. So you could see that we have um, a stiff and a soft building block um, of a protein, and it can either lead to a material that is um, like a spider web that has highly localized damage, or the same building block can be used by arranging it differently geometrically in space, um, basically by, by creating an architected material, which is now called, um, uh, you can create a material that is that is spreading the damage and create high toughness. And so this idea of, of using hierarchical scaling is universal in these in many of these biological materials. And that's one of the unifying principles we see um, that we've done, that we have discovered and, and, and utilized and exploited in the work we do. Where here's another example of a, of a system. This is an immediate filament network. This is also work by Jia Jin and a former student, Theodor Akbarov, uh, who was in the lab in the, in the early years of my, of my time at MIT. And, and uh, this work actually looked at the, the mechanics of filament networks in cells. This is a nuclear envelope, which is made from a protein called lamin. And um, if you have a uh, look at a lamin network um, using TM, you're going to see there are a lot of defects in there. And, uh, you know, of course, cells are exposed to very significant deformation. You know, every time you, uh, you twist your arm or you stretch your skin or, um, uh, you know, maybe you think too hard, your brain will be twisted as well sometimes. Um, and, um, and so when that happens, um, you, um, you're going to load these, these networks. And the question that we asked is, how come these, um, these networks don't break? And we found actually that um, because of the architecture of having an interplay of these soft bonds that can, can unfold very easily and create these very nonlinear relationships of force and extension, and uh, the design of a, of a lattice structure is, uh, creates an opportunity for these cracks to orient themselves differently uh, as a function of loading. So these uh, materials are sort of smart, self-protecting materials where if you think about the initial geometry, uh, you think about the English solution, you have a high stress concentration, you load the material in the, in the vertical direction. Now, as you pull this material, you can do this experiment, um, but we've done it simulation-wise, and uh, you can do an experiment too with a, with a mesh structure. Uh, you will see that this, this crack actually changes orientation, and that's because the energy to unfold these proteins is very low. So there's very little energy cost, as well as the fact that there's no interaction between neighboring cells. So there's no shear resistance right? because we have a network that's porous. So porosity or void actually allows these materials to achieve properties that make it more resilient. So if you had, if you didn't have the void in there, right? So this material would not behave like this. You would have uh, stress concentration and probably snapping of these filaments very easily at low deformation. By this design, you allow the material to be um, self-healing, if you wish, right? So the material actually, the crack avoids being dangerous. It, it, it changes its shape to become less, less, less significant. So, so this is sort of what we, uh, we call the UDP, as I mentioned, and we, uh, we can see this in, in a more systematic approach where we, we can look at how um, material scientists, we usually uh, like to uh, make this triangle of, of microstructure, a process to create the microstructure <laughs> and a property. And of course, now we look at nature and we look at these multiple hierarchical scales, uh, we're going to see that each level has its own triangle, right? Each level has its own design space. And then, of course, all these design spaces interact, right? So if you change something at the nano scale, you're going to affect properties at the larger scale. And some of them are independent, some are related. And that's been really the, the drive in my lab to understand these relationships and trying to come up with ideas in, in using these insights to create new materials that yeah, nature hasn't invented yet, right? We want to go beyond nature. In fact, so work, the work with David has, um, and uh, Jigang, you were asking earlier about that. So, so this is work we, uh, we have a, 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 many papers with David on, on, on using the modeling as a predictive tool. Um, and, and yeah, many, much of this actually is, is funded by the NIH um, uh, to be able to create design of biomaterials. That's the objective here. Uh, we can design um, uh, protein materials. A lot of them are inspired by silk or use silk as a building block. Um, with very distinct um, mechanical signatures. This is actually uh, work by my former postdoc, Cheng Ji Ling, who is now at Shanghai Tech, and, uh, and maybe he's listening, I don't know, but uh, Cheng Ji did amazing work in the lab, uh, actually in it, both bridging both the theory and the experiments. He was one of those shared student or postdocs that, that Dave and I had. So, so we can make many different materials um, based on this insight. And so it's an example of how having a mechanics, mechanistic insight into how these materials work, having a model, allows us to design things, right? So that's very good for engineers. We can, we can go beyond, push the envelope and you know, design things in the Ashby plot. But you know, once we did that, we, we became you know, really, really intrigued, not only by making materials in the lab um, synthetically using, not spiders, but using synthetic you know, chemistry or, or bacteria, 
But also we became interested really heavily in, in understanding how the actual insect works and how they make things and how they build the web. And, and so that led into um, you know, pretty big effort uh, in collaboration actually with Tomas Saracino, who I mentioned earlier already, and, and, and his group, where we um, have uh, a, a whole set of live spiders in our lab at MIT that we, we investigate. And I'm gonna give you a little context. So when you think about spiders, they, um, they're kind of different than what we do when we build things. So, so that's my, uh, my civil engineering slide. Um, so uh, uh, and engineers want to make things, we, uh, we use usually scaffolding, right? Uh, cranes and scaffolding, and, and, um, and it takes a long time, right? And once you build things, um, it's hard to change the shape of the building, right? It's, it, takes, it takes a lot of effort. So what, uh, what, we, what we think about spiders, uh, they use you know, a very different paradigm. And so spiders are these you know, incredible insects, actually, that, um, that build these webs. And uh, the webs are you know, part of the organism itself. So the webs actually are part of the spider's body, if you wish. Um, they can repair it. Um, they, they make it, they repair it. They use it for prey, for mating, for storing food, for storing eggs, um, for interacting, for communicating. Um, and I'll, I'll talk much more about that in a moment, but, but spiders are basically blind. So the way they experience the world actually is through vibrations. And, and that's uh, you know, one of the connections we have to sound and music that spiders are interesting prototypes for an organism that actually uses vibrations to sense structure in the, in the environment. So spiders um, you know, live in these, in these webs. Um, they, um, you can actually find them in a lot of different places. This is um, uh, quite, quite an interesting picture, actually. This is a, um, 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 these are baby spiders that are, that are born, and, and you can actually see how they, they're initially protected by a, a web, um, and you can see some of these spiders are getting out, right? And so that's how they, Sort of hatch into the world and, and become their own adult spiders and, and begin, begin to live their own life. Um, so spiders, as you can see, they use the silk not only for catching prey, um, they use it also for uh, a procreation, uh, protecting food, uh, wrapping food. And, um, and spider webs um, aren't always all webs, right? So the, the spider webs you see, um, typically if you ask someone to draw a web, um, they draw an old web, right? The one you've seen many times in the talk already. These webs here, you can see they look quite different. Um, and in fact, actually most spider webs look different. And so to, to get into this, um, to study webs that are unusual, um, to study webs not in the field, like we've done earlier for the nature paper, we actually did experiments out in the field, literally went into the field, um, found webs and, and, and deformed them and took photos of them and analyzed them. But we wanted to have uh, spiders in the lab that we could, uh, we could ask, ask, kindly ask to build webs. Uh, and so this is Tomas, uh, my collaborator Tomas, this is Jao. And um, he's been a regular visitor in our lab um, and he uh, supplies us with spiders and these spiders live in little cages um, above water. I have a more, a more detailed more schematic in a moment. And, um, and uh, these spiders build webs and uh, you can kind of see the web here, right? This little structure here. These webs are built um, you know, using the, the ecological approach that the spider has and, and you know, eating flies, you feed the spider fly and, fly, and um, then the spider builds a web. And uh, we can study the web. We can watch the spider build the web, or we can um, analyze the web, look at the mechanics, and, and other things like that. So I'll spend a great deal of time, actually, in the next couple of minutes to talk about those, those details. But, um, but having the spiders is amazing. You know, we, we have now the ability to, um, to, to actually watch the spider create the structures. Uh, we, can, we can study all aspects of that. Um, we can uh, watch the spider you know, do its thing. Um, this is just the photos. And you know what they build at the end are, are really amazing geometries. And I want to mention that most of the webs, uh, actually, most of the time when you see a web like this, you call it a, people call it cobwebs, and you might find it in a garage or in a or in a you know room in a building, and um, or in your basement, and you're not going to like it maybe, and you're going to use a broom to get rid of it, right? Um, and and actually, if you were to take a, a microscope or some light, and, and you're going to see that these have incredible structural details. They're extremely interesting structurally, mechanically and from many different angles, as I'll show you. So if you kind of take that microscope and you know, become a scientist and you explore the web, you're gonna see that even in these kind of cobweb structures that don't, don't look like much, uh, you're gonna find a lot of interesting structure in there. And, and, and if, you, if you take good photos, you can see them. This is a photo that Tomas took in his lab, in his group in um, Berlin. Um, but, um, but we can also scan them and, and actually create a three-dimensional model, not just two-dimensional images. And so when we did this, now this is work done by Isabel, uh, grad student in the lab right now. She has spent uh, several years in perfecting the, the method of, of scanning webs. Um, uh, Tomas actually had you know, built an initial prototype of that. 
And um, then at MIT, we, uh, we you know, took that prototype of scanning and perfected it and automated it, and now have a, a setup that can automatically scan webs for multiple iterations of webs while the construction is happening. And, and the way this looks like is the following. These are the cages. You've seen those cages a few slides ago. Spiders live in there. There's water in there, so they don't escape. Um, they stay in the cage. They don't like to go into the water. Um, and then we have a camera. Um, and we have a sheet laser. So the sheet laser lights up sections of a web and we take photos, many photos, and we can orient the sheet laser differently. So we get um, pictures of the three-dimensional structure in 2D projection in different angles. And, um, and then we, uh, we can automate this process um, by, by scanning the web multiple times. And, and so this is um, you know, something that actually required um, um, some real, uh, real experimental um, effort, not only in, in conducting the experiments, but also building the setup and it was done by several generations of students. Isabel is Isabel is the primary driver behind this. She's the grad student. We had um, undergrad students, um, several generations of capstone students, and, and also undergrad researchers. Um, currently in the lab is Miosha. She actually started working on this project, has since moved on to other projects at, in our lab, which is really exciting. And then Marcos was in the lab a summer ago, um, seems like an eternity ago. He was an IRU student for the MERSEC program in the, in, in the Center for Material Science. And he, he actually played an integral part of, of automating and building this, this setup that I'm gonna show you now. So um, this is uh, Neosha and Isabel. They um, were expecting the, the web structure. You can see the sheet laser here, the camera. And you know how does this look like? So once you scan the web, this is how that that movie looks like. This movie actually was taken by Marcus last summer, and um, and you can kind of we're kind of delving, diving into the web structure now, okay? And and we can see how um, you know there's a lot of interesting details in there. And you know as a mechanician, you see this and you see trusses, right? You see maybe architectural materials. You begin to see uh, maybe tensegrity structures or whatnot. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting questions you can ask. Um, you can ask geometric questions. So what are the, 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 the kind of geometries you see? What's the factor index of these systems and, and so forth? How, do they, how are they built? What happens if you break some of these filaments? What's the spider going to do? So all these are questions we're trying to answer. But, but once you have a scan like this, uh, and I'll show you in a moment how we make the scan into a model, uh, we have this. So we have an initial structure of the actual build structure. We have a model in the end, which has all these different regions, all these different features we can now explore. And, and that process, you know, again, you know, captures the entire, the entire ecological approach that the spider has by eating a fly, building a web within 24 to 36 hours. That's how long, how long it takes you to build a web um, and you know, making a model. Now the model is really important because it lives in a computer. And as you know, I, I love things that live in computers. Um, and it's also an analytical model. It's not a model that's just pixels. Actually, the, the, the beauty of this and the, the genius of, of Isabel's um, algorithm is that she has figured out a way of, of creating a, a basically a tomography approach that takes these color images, moves them to grayscale, binarizes them, stacks them, creates a skeleton model, and then ultimately, that's the final product, is actually a, a, a line network of nodes connected um, by these filaments. And, and that model is, if you wish, an analytical description of the web geometry, right? So we have um, precise coordinates of, of every single filament, every single connection uh, in, in the web structure from, from the scan. And, and this works really well. Uh, this, by the way, is a, another scan. Uh, this is a bigger web, a more intricate web. And again, we're kind of diving into the web now. And uh, you can see in the beginning, it looks kind of random, right? Um, and I, I want to have, have a little surprise for you as you watch this. Um, very soon, you're going to see some really interesting features emerge. Um, of course, now it's not a surprise anymore. Now you know what to look for. But uh, very soon, here we go. Uh, you can see kind of like entering a tunnel, and you're actually beginning to enter the, the Ken region of the web. You can kind of see that this region has a very high mesh density, so the structure isn't amorphous anymore. It has a very high density. It's almost like a mesh uh, textile. And you know, the, and the, at the other end, of course, you come out of the other end again. And, these, these kind of structures are, are things we can now see for the first time. And that's a, a little um, you know, a, a movie of, this, of the model that lives in the computer. Um, Jao created that, that movie. And, um, and then we kind of really see, you can see how you go inside that. And you know, in the beginning, we, um, we had this available as basically a visualization tool. And we would analyze that mathematically for the mechanics. But uh, we also wanted to have a way of, of, of analyzing this understanding structure um, by actually um, interacting more interactively using virtual reality. And we've done that as well. I'll show a movie of that also. But 
yeah, so this was um, these kind of uh, you know studies of three-dimensional webs are quite unique. Then there aren't a lot of studies of 3D webs. Most most uh, spider web uh, investigations really are two-dimensional webs, which are actually the minority of webs in the world that spiders make are 2D. The majority are much more complex three-dimensional webs. Um, they create a beautiful visualization. This is an overlay of all many different layers. Uh, you can kind of see the different uh, features in there. Um, and um, and again, um, one really exciting thing we're working on right now, and we got a little bit, um, we got a, um, a you know a wrench thrown into the, the gear of the lab by COVID because we couldn't continue this. Um, but we've done some initial, we have initial data on um, on on the on, on imaging of the construction of the web. Um, this was done right 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 before the shutdowns happened. Um, but you can see you know that you know we can actually watch the spider build the web, and and these are pretty coarse right now in resolution. You can see the hours passing. Um, we're going to do that much more accurately and uh, find a resolution. So we hope to have a, a very accurate description, not only of the web itself, but also how it's made and how the spider responds to perturbations of, of the web. So I think a lot more to come there. Um, but, um, but let's sort of um, think about the web and, and again, take a step back now and think that the ecosystem clearly is not static, right? So first of all, you know, there's always environmental impacts. Um, there's prey, there's damage. And, so because the web is an extension of the spider's body, it's a living structure, it also vibrates. And in fact, um, sort of the, you can imagine this web to be a gigantic hub. So if you, if you are a mechanician, you see a string and you know, maybe you, you, you teach uh, mechanics or physics for undergrads, one of the first things you study is uh, vibration of strings um, and harmonics and, and waves and things like this. And the web actually can be seen like that. Now it's not a single string, right? It's uh, hundreds, thousands of strings and each of the strings has a certain vibrational frequency if you plug it. And the spider actually lives in a world that is full of vibrations because it's blind or virtually blind. It actually interacts with the world through thousands and thousands of sensors of vibrational sensors, tiny hairs in their bodies that sense these vibrations. And it actually communicates with other spiders uh, through vibrations. It uh, senses prey, um, senses threats, uh, checks the web's integrity. Uh, through these kind of sensory um, vibrations. And so when you think about the web structure, it, you know, it really is um, uh, sort of a you know, really interesting system that, um, that is not static. And I'll show you a little movie that I found on, on YouTube. Uh, it's a yellow garden spider. And apparently these spiders actually, uh, they, they literally shake the web to create uh, responses, either maybe to attract insects or to get rid of insects. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure, but they, they actually use their bodies to create these significant vibrations um, to in, 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 in the web structure. So, so again, um, so spiders are, are really live in a, in, a, in, a, in a vibrational context and, and these are the sensors they have. So this is a tarantula foot um, and uh, you can see these hairs. Um, you turn on the laser pointer again and these are the hairs. That's the entire uh, spider. So we don't have those in the lab, okay, but, but, um, but they have a bunch of hairs and these hairs are are very visible in the big spider like this, but um, but tiny spiders also have them, and uh, and they sense the environment. So this led us sort of to think, as we study spiders, um, we uh, become very involved with this cause, and we want to become more like a spider, and want to become a, a spider um, and see the world like the spider does. And so to that effect, we began to develop a an approach actually to to begin to see and sense the vibrational spectrum of what the spider sees, uh, not with the eyes, the eyes, but actually with its ears or sensors. They're not really ears, they're hairs, right? Um, and so what we've done is we've built a sonification model. And sonification is a way, essentially, of taking a scientific model or data. And in this case, we're computing vibrations of the strings to make these, uh, these types of vibrations audible. And you can imagine, you can appreciate that having a, a web, it's like a harp, right? And you can pluck different strings or you can listen to all the strings at the same time, you can shake the entire web. And if you listen to this, it's gonna create some sort of sound, some sort of music, some sort of um, audible expression. And this model we've developed um, allows us to do that. And, and the way we did this actually, we created a virtual reality environment. So you can uh, really become a spider if you wish, right? You can go inside the web and this is um, a movie that is about made out of that virtual reality environment. Um, there's a tutorial, you can learn how to use it and you can kind of see how yeah, you can choose the settings of what you're gonna hear. Um, you can hear um, in the simple setup, basically in the direction where you look, you're gonna hear that region vibrate. You can hear those resonances of that region in your ears. It's gonna create an audible experience. I'll, I'll show you, actually, I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll make you hear it. I'll have an audio that I'm gonna play in a moment, but, but this is how the virtual reality set uh, looks like. And, um, and as you go through this process, setting it up, uh, you can then actually explore the web structure um, using virtual reality. You can enter the spider web and, and um, explore it. You can listen to it, or you can even use it as a musical instrument. And I'll show you how we use that uh, for performances at MIT and in Paris and many other places um, um, around. So, um, so in the main moment, yeah, we're gonna go into, into the game now. So it's just really like a, a game. Um, and the game is one where you can explore the web. So this is how it looks like. So you go inside and you can hear the sounds now. Um, I hope you can hear it. Um, these are the sounds that the spider web makes. That sounds pretty eerie and it sounds weird because these strings aren't tuned to anything, right? They're tuned um, really, they just vibrate to whatever frequency they have, um, tuned by the length, the tension in the web. Um, and so forth. And if you were to pull on some of the web, um, the frequency would go up, of course, and so you can actually hear these things as, as you go through this process. So if you sort of systematically look through the entire web, uh, this is a little, um, little animation that sort of walks you through the entire web structure. And um, on the left is the original data from the, from the scan. What you hear are the, the filaments sort of lighting up in your ears that are currently visible. They're actually the ones in color here. So as we go through the web, these are different projections of the web, you're going to hear these frequencies emerge. And, and this is really interesting uh, or important, I think, because, of course, many for many um, hundreds of years, um, you know, humans have utilized mechanics as a way of creating sound to build musical instruments. So it's been part of our culture, and, and mechanics actually obviously has been the, the key driver, the enabler to create anything like guitars or strings and other things like this. And for um, for the first, um, you know, I would say thousands of years, um, humans worked with macroscopic objects to create sound, like drums, membranes, strings, uh, air, and things like this. But now that we have access to the microscopic world of, say, spiders, or even later we're going to talk about proteins, uh, we can think about building, using mechanics to build entirely new types of musical instruments. Uh, so this instrument you just saw in a little more detail, it actually can be used for live performances. And this is what we have done in a, in a couple of places around the world. We have had uh, performances of this spider web instrument we call it the spider's canvas or arachnid drone. Um, and, and inside the web, you can kind of see how we, we, we build a, a, a massive prototype of this web um, on the stage. So we can we scale it up so you can, everyone in the audience can see it um, and hear it. Um, and uh, there are a couple of human players, um, and there, there is the, the spider itself playing, which actually is modeled by Isabella. So Isabella sits inside the spider web, and she's using that VR setup to basically meander around the web, exploring different regions, creating different sounds. And then Evan, Christine, um, and Ian actually uh, were human players that um, played with conventional instruments like, um, like, um, like guitars and other, other instruments, sort of jamming with this, with this, with this natural structure. So this, Performance, you can find it online if you're interested. You can hear, listen to the whole, whole thing. Um, really, it was interesting because it allowed us to begin to, to scale up the nano scale of microscopic world uh, to, a, to a scale that is more accessible to humans. And of course, as a, as a scientist, as a, as a mechanician, I'm, we're very interested in understanding we're better. You know, how do these spider webs actually work? And what kind of um, frequencies do we hear? And it turns out, actually, of course, as you can imagine, these, uh, these spider webs are amorphous in their geometry. You know, they have variations of lengths, variations of tensions, and uh, there's no particular tuning. So if you think about a, um, a piano or guitar, before you play it, um, you need to tune it. And we tune it usually according to some tuning system, uh, a very popular one uh, that has, uh, you know, I think is dominating mo most of the musical evolution in the last couple of decades is what's called harmonic tuning, which basically means uh, that um, you have uh, even ratios of frequencies, um, which can be approximated by uh, what's called equal temperament. You might have come across that term. Um, and it is really an approximation to have um, these uh, approximately even ratios. You can see how in this uh, equal temperament tuning, um, these points um, when you divide the octave in 12 uh, divisions, um, they fall approximately on these dividing lines where you have multiple integers. And, Multiple integers sound good together, and that's why they work really well for musical instruments. Now, of course, the spider web doesn't work like this. So this is kind of like the conventional way we create music is through these structured tuning systems. And this allows us to create a model of something that's like a solid or crystal, right? So it has structure, short and long range structure. 
in the spider web, we don't have that. So it's more like a liquid or amorphous tuning, we call it amorphous tuning. And, and again, if you, you look at these, uh, the tuning system, like the equal temperament tuning, um, they are an approximation only actually of um, what's called harmonic tuning, which is the more accurate tuning system. Um, um, but it, it allows you to basically play notes on a keyboard, on a piano together, and they sound good. That's sort of the, in a nutshell, um, the, the, the idea behind that. And, and of course, now, as you recall, listening to the spider web, it didn't sound good, right? It sounded eerie, it sounded weird. And that's because it doesn't follow these tuning system, has an amorphous tuning. And in fact, if you look at this frequency spectrogram of different kinds of webs, um, you can see this is the frequency on the y-axis. The x-axis is time or, or geometric dimension as you scan through the web. Uh, you can see that these um, you know, lines are kind of crooked, right? Um, and they don't align in any particular pattern. Um, they, they just randomly uh, you know, kind of assemble in this frequency space. And that's what is ca it's caused by this, by this amorphous structure. Now we can change this actually. And if we were thinking about using a mechanics approach now to, um, to create, to use the spider web instrument, which is quite interesting, create sounds that are very intriguing and unique. And we haven't heard of those yet because the human ear, the human, uh, in the human history, we haven't actually used the spider web to make music yet. We, we have only used um, strings which have very organized vibrational patterns, like first harmonic, second, third, fourth harmonic. A spider web has sort of these thousands of different anharmonic amorphous um, 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 frequencies associated with it. We can use uh, mathematics to actually recreate structures and add more structure to the piece. And, and sort of this is the idea that um, you know, when we work with Tomas and, um, and, and other artists, we, we began to think about uh, using the spider web and its structure and its audio uh, to model really what the spider does. And the spider eats a fly or we eat food and our body actually is able to take this amorphous input of pretty much anything. And we can, our body is able to organize this stuff that we eat, uh, the spider or whatever we eat um, and organize this through the DNA building plan into an organized structure. It's no longer a fly. The fly has been transformed into a silk protein or a collagen protein or cells and things like this. And uh, this can actually be modeled in an audio space uh, by reconstructing musical structure using a method called granular synthesis. And now what is that? Well, granular synthesis basically means that you take um, the audio that the spider has um, sort of created and, um, and you, uh, you can shift the frequencies to match harmonics. And you know, this um, audio, I'm gonna play it actually in the background. What, what we do here is we use the original audio. In the beginning, you can hear, uh, it sounds like the, the eerie, crazy spider web music. Um, and as we kind of like traverse through the web, um, as we go along, we increasingly shift the frequencies to the harmonics, right? And that means we're gonna get closer and closer to equal temperament tuning which um, as we play this, these, these melodies, these progressions here, um, it sounds increasingly beautiful and harmonic. And the reason is of course that as we go along, you can hear that now, it sounds very different. Um, we begin to shift into these straight lines, which are basically the resemblances of these crystals. And right? in the end, actually we go a little bit away from that again, kind of here we can go more into the chaos of, this, of, of the original web structure. So this, um, you know, allows us to, to begin to understand um, the use of a, a, a structure like a web. Um, and it could be any other geometry. You can imagine, um, you know, sonifying any other geometry to, uh, to use uh, the, the knowledge we have about how strings vibrate and how they sound well together to morph the sound into new kinds of expressions that can actually create what we conventionally call music, at least the Western traditional uh, history of, of music in that sense. So the web is uh, quite interesting. It can make music. It can also make, um, you know, teaches about mechanics more. Uh, in, in recent work, we just actually published this paper, I think um, it came out online uh, maybe a, a week ago, two weeks ago, as Isabella has published in JMPS. It was a, a, a very systematic analysis of the, a web structure and looking at how microstructure correlates with mechanical signatures. And so you can appreciate having um, these web structures we have an enormous amount of data and we can take uh, the web and break it into little pieces. You've seen when you were flying through the web, right? There are many different kinds of uh, microstructures. Each is gonna have a different mechanical signature. So what are these? Well, so what Isabel did is she, she divided the web into little chunks and studied the mechanical properties of each chunk. And, uh, you know, characterized, um, you know, first of all, how many different types of distributions do we have? And it actually turns out there's kind of two major density distribution uh, peaks in there. Um, 
uh, you know, a, sort of a web with low density and a web geometry with higher density. And, uh, you know, they have different stress strain responses. So you can, we can put in the, uh, the stress strain response of each filament that we've derived earlier. We talked about the, the, the nanoscale up, uh, approach to this. Um, we can put that in there and then take the unit cell and pull it and create a considered relationship of the unit cell. And, and you know, this is kind of shown here, right? So you can take that web piece, the fragment the sample, you can pull it and, you know, create stress strain responses in different directions of pulling. And by doing this for many different web samples, uh, we can create these relationships, right? And so these relationships now are toughness versus density relationships um, or strength versus uh, density relationships. And, you know, they give us an appreciation now for what kind of microstructures lead to what kind of features. And this is important because ultimately we, yeah, we're interested in, in using the web in inspiring new technology, right? New architectural materials, uh, new bridges, um, you know, new fiber networks and other things like this. And so to do that, we need this relationship. We need to understand the mechanism behind that. Um, I've actually got a step beyond this and actually, you know, used the full web and broken into little samples and, and actually expanded the number of independent variables. We have looked at the input being average fiber length, the orientation in the XYZ direction, the average continuous boundary and the density, right? So now we've expanded to six independent variables and then use um, you know, many of these graphs, many of these stress strain relationships and, uh, and fed that as a big data set of thousands of different uh, data points into a deep learning model, which allows us then to predict um, and from these independent variables, uh, dependent variables like strength, x and y and z direction, and toughness in x and y and z direction. So we, we have um, a neural network now that allows us to sort of act as a considerative law. Right? And this is a very elegant way of creating a considerative law that can actually very accurately describe the mechanics of web. So we took this model that we've, uh, we've trained uh, with an 80-20 split of testing and training set to validate that against a web that the model has never seen, okay? And so when you have a web that the model has never seen, we have a, a test which is using the mechanics, the actual physics of simulating the web versus the prediction by the machine learning model. And you can see how uh, these two lines, these two curves agree remarkably well for all these different relationships. So, so it's a very powerful model, it works really well and allows us to very quickly predict. So instead of running a long simulation, right, of many hundreds of fibers or thousands of fibers, we now can put in just these key variables and predict um, properties. We can do surface plots uh, for like an Ashby-like chart. And we can also use this model to you know, learn a little bit more about biology. So yeah, this is a really fun part of that work is to think if you, if you have a web structure, the, the web structure actually um, relies on, on, on uh, the, the spider relies on the web to catch prey, one, one of the functions biologically. And there, these, uh, these preys have different kinds of sizes, of course, right? We have flies, we have wasps. Um, in this case, we only look at those two. And the different sizes and different natural speeds in which they fly. And so we've done a systematic analysis um, to find the critical velocity and sizes um, of different objects to be trapped in the web. And you know, that's something actually when, when Steve and I and Anna worked on the web structure many years ago, we, we had the 2D webs, we, we, we thought about that. We didn't quite do that, I think extensively at least at that time. But now with the 3D webs, we've done a full analysis of, of actually how different kinds of prey might be caught or not caught in the web. And we've been able to uh, calculate the dividing lines. Um, so if you look, for example, at this, um, the wasps here, um, so this gives you a projectile velocity here um, over the web density. So if you want to catch the wasp, right, you can either increase the web density or you can reduce the velocity of, of, of this projectile. And the same happens to the fly. So this is, you know, I think the first time we've characterized the mechanics of how prey is caught and how that relates to the microstructure of the web. We've also used this web to inspire um, designs, in this case, uh, bridges. We had, a, I had an MN student, Asia Hecko, who who just graduated a few weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and she actually went and, and, and used the web as an inspiration for structural design to create a footbridge. And she has uh, you know, utilized uh, design motifs from the web structure to, to understand um, deflections and design and, and as, as tried to design an actual footbridge. And we were hoping to build it, but then again, we couldn't do that because um, all campus was shut down, but we would maybe do that in future years. Uh, we hopefully have a, a spider bridge maybe between buildings at MIT. I don't know if they allow us to do that, but 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 that's sort of the idea, right? So you can, as an architect or a civil engineer, or you're a structural engineer, you begin to, to think about these webs as an inspiration for structure. Um, we can make them um, in the lab, of course. We have done earlier work with Jennifer Lewis. We worked on on printing printing all webs. But that was also really fun, but these were all webs, 2D webs. Now that we're interested in 3D webs, we've gotten really involved in, you know, in finding ways to 
3D print these uh, 3D webs and they create, you know, really just incredible features. And it's, you know, interesting when you when you take a web and you look at it in the computer, even in virtual reality, put your glasses on and you have the, the music, the sound, you have the visual, uh, there's nothing like actually seeing an actual real web and then holding it in your hand and actually going inside with your eyes and, and you know, and touching it. And so, so that's uh, something we can do now. And, you know, just to sort of summarize a little bit what we've done, um, you know, we've looked at webs from you know, many different perspectives, obviously. Um, there's a high robust resiliency. Uh, the, the webs are designed to avoid structural collapse. So there's a lot of really interesting mechanical features in there. Um, you've seen some of those examples I've shown. Um, there's different regions, tangle regions, um, to basically provide food to the spider. Um, there's the less dense region uh, and the higher dense region. And basically these uh, tangle regions allow the prey to go through to then be caught in the web. So in a way that the web, the way we look at the web now, after that JMPS paper is really a, it's a gradient, right? So it's a gradient material. Um, if, if you look at the, the entire web as a material where the lower density on the outside acts like a, a filter for maybe the big particles, but then the smaller particles of flies and the wasps actually get through and they get to the point where the spider actually wants to have the prey and wants to eat the prey and, uh, and actually is not being eaten by anything else. So that's protected in there. So, so that's some, some interesting ecological insights, but you know, I mentioned earlier, we have a BL2 lab uh, now at, at, in my group at MIT, and we, we use that to, uh, and I won't have much on this, but I wanted to just mention this. Um, not only can we work with proteins, we can also, of course, we've expanded our interest in, in thinking about other biomass as a way of building materials. And so when you look at nature, you have uh, pigment manure, for instance, algae, wood, sewage sludge, uh, chitin, uh, fishery waste, and you know, all this stuff is waste, right? Most of that is waste. Wood, not always waste, but wood chips, you know, let's say, put it that way. Um, and you know, these, um, these uh, materials aren't used for anything, right? Because we're unable to recycle them, to make them into something useful. And we are uh, you know, really trying very hard to use the machinery of modeling, of mechanics, mechanistic insights into how these materials work to use the chemical building blocks. And it turns out, of course, if you think about uh, sewage stuff, which is basically what comes out of your, um, your, your sewage uh, into the town, um, that solid leftover resi residue is extremely rich chemically, has many different chemical groups, and is sort of a, it, it, it's, it's a shame we're throwing it away, right? Because it has so much different chemistry involved. So if we could actually uh, tease out these building blocks and could reassemble them in different ways, um, uh, we can make amazing materials from that. And then we don't know how to do that yet, but that's what we, we're trying to do. So one way we do that um, using a chemical engineering approach is using high HTP, is, um, a process where we use a high temperature, high pressure, and to process materials, create different faces, and then use other assembly techniques beyond that to really experimentally come up with technologies to make um, useful things out of that. We do that in our lab. This is a picture of the lab um, where we have, we, we do that, and we can make um, you know, real materials from that. We have the ability to make, um, um, to make filaments for 3D printing, so, so we can make out of waste, we can make um, new filaments from algae and, and sewage sludge and pig manure, and uh, we can then print them into uh, gyroids or other things like that, dark bone specimens. And we can also make um, interesting materials. Like this is a recent paper we just published a few weeks ago uh, with Fick Prichette at MIT, <clears throat> chemical engineering. He's an expert in, in flow batteries, and flow batteries require electrodes. And the design of these electrodes is one of the, one of the holy grails, right? So you want to make sure these these uh, electrodes provide good exchange for ions. And it turns out these biomaterials, and in this case, we use fishery waste, shrimp waste, have very high performance for flow batteries. So we've sort of found a way of utilizing some of these waste products and creating and engineering a product that has very high performance. So um, let me shift gears. Um, I'm coming to the last part of the, the, the lecture. Um, you know, as we have seen, um, we kind of connected many different uh, you know, areas of, of, of mechanics and physics and materials. But let's sort of take another step back now and think about the relationship between vibrations, waves, and matter. And, and, and of course, in, you know, in, a, in, a, in a concept of physics, we have the quantum scale, the wave particle duality. We have for the spider already seen that uh, these vibrations are the sensory feedback mechanism. This is what the spider sees. So when you see a web, actually, the web is a result of vibrations being sensed by the spider to make decisions. So it's a materialization of, vibra of vibrations. And of course, sound is something that we as humans can, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms by which we can sense vibrations and, and, and superpositions of different frequencies very well. So what we have sort of set out to do is to think, can we 
utilize vibrations, you know, actually starting from simple sine waves, which is really the, the basic building block of any waveform, uh, can we use harmonic waves as a way of describing the materials and actually build models of materials um, based on based on waves? And and I'll and I think once we go through that section of the talk, uh, it'll make a lot of sense why we're doing that. But but so stay tuned. So the idea is the following: you know, if you think about materials design, the problem you have is you want to kind of create your 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 new new, new microstructure, your new architectural material, your new design, your new composite. And the way you do that is you basically take the building blocks, which are kind of like Lego pieces, and you put them together in different fashions, and you create the material. Now, if you are a, a, um, a um, an engineer, um, and what if you could um, transform the material into uh, an audible model? What if you could hear the material, and you could actually manipulate the material, make a new material by designing different sounds? And then translate that sound back into the material, right? So can you do that? And so the reason why this is potentially very promising is because, of course, um, if you have sound, sound provides a, a direct access to our brain, right? So if you think about listening to something, um, these are pressure waves in air. Go to your ear, um, you know, go to your eardrum. The eardrum is, is a mechanical system actually involving collagen, which is the mechanical character. We have a, a uh, a study. Uh, I have a postdoc, Mario Milazzo, who, who is who's working on that. I, I don't have much results on this in this talk. It didn't fit in, but we have a whole um, study on, on the mechanics of collagen as a mechanical character of sound. But but conceptually, we, we know already that um, you know these um, collagen molecules are critical for transforming sound ultimately to our nerve cells into the brain. And the brain, as you can see here, there's a study by Limba L, Johns Hopkins, and many others have shown that. You're listening to sound and music, it actually has a physiological effect on the structure in your brain. And, and so this, um, of course, the brain can be uh, converted right, into an artificial neural network as well. So you can imagine um, you know, replacing the human brain with an artificial neural network to manipulate sound and creating new kinds of sound and then translating back into material. And that's what we'll, we'll show. So the, the connection you know, really between um, you know, music in particular, sound in general, is and, and materials is actually very profound and, and, and so this uh, what you hear in the background is uh, you know, classical music and the way we can understand music mechanistically right is it's really by uh, by you know building it up right? from a if you're a mechanical engineer or a material scientist you want to build things up right you want to create the plans right for that and the plan is the following you begin by waveforms like sine waves we can manipulate sine waves um the volume or frequency pitch and you know, that gives rise to different sounds of instruments. Right? So if you think about a trumpet versus a guitar, they're gonna have different histories of how volume progresses over time. Then you can play different tones to create chords, to create melodies. And ultimately in uh, you know, classical music like you hear in the background, you can actually hear multiple instruments playing together. Uh, and that creates a symphony, a symphony or a band. If you play in a band, you, know, you create these different instruments over there. And, in materials, it's very same, right? In very similar, you have in, in proteins, for instance, you have 20 amino acid building blocks, which form uh, universal building blocks like secondary structures, alpha helices, beta sheets, which covered them already earlier, uh, nanostructures, filaments, and the web structure. So it's kind of the same hierarchy we built up. So the question we asked is, you know, can we uh, sort of systematically explore that? And it actually built, if you wish, a mechanics model of music and, and systematically explore relationships between different manifestations of, of matter in sound and then translating that back in, into matter as well. So when you think about music, um, it's not just something we want to listen to, but actually um, we think that a lot of really interesting discoveries about relationships of hierarchical systems have been made in music. And so for instance, we have, um, if you look at a score like Beethoven, uh, so even if you don't read musical scores, you can see that this piece, if you kind of spend a little bit of time to look at it, um, is actually a, a you know very simple construction if you wish and it has it's a, it's a composite structure um, like a composite in a in bone or in a, or an engineer composite where you have building blocks on um, a for instance here you can see these notes go up and down up and down up and down rapid succession you have another kind of building block which i call building block b for this illustration here where the uh, succession goes up and up and up and up and then also down 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 right? so it's a very different pattern if you wish. and now this kind of resembles the stiff and soft building block we talked about earlier, right? So these proteins having different manifestations. And as you can see, uh, Beethoven actually utilized these building blocks and put them together in different patterns as the music evolves. And, and the reason why we enjoy music or can actually appreciate that is actually this interplay of repetition and variation. And, and that's why the spider web 
didn't sound very good, right? To our ears because it was chaotic. It was amorphous in structure. Now in conventional music composition, um, we have a, a designed interplay of variation and repetition and, uh, in, in, in this buildup. So that's one of the mechanics principles behind that. And we can actually go beyond that and, and build uh, a mathematical model of this process. And so we've done this in, you know, actually over the years for a couple of different systems. Um, and there uh, was a recent paper by Romeyer et al. That, that did some really amazing work. And what this is, is basically building the grammar of music for different styles. You can imagine that if you have um, classical music or jazz or rap music, uh, they all gonna have different rules by which they're built. So they sound differently and we can recognize them. And mathematically, we can build these up um, using category theory, for instance, that allows us to describe building blocks, relations between building blocks. And this can be done for music and you can kind of go and reconstruct the score by just following the rules, okay? That's what a composer will do, but we can also mathematically boil that down to that level. Or we can do that for proteins as well. And so actually for proteins, um, we can do the same thing, right? We have building blocks like sequence, which can be reconstructed by having certain functional requirements, which allow us to build these hierarchy of structure. So that can be done mathematically. And, and actually it, it's beautiful in a way. You can, you can reconstruct uh, music like Bach, for instance, is a very algorithmic uh, music compositional technique uh, that, uh, that you can reconstruct using these mathematical principles. Uh, one particular example that I was recently uh, studying for a, a seminar that I did with uh, a bunch of uh, music theoreticians is uh, Bach's Goldberg variations. And if you haven't heard of it, it's you know, an incredible mathematical uh, example actually of, of, of variations and repetitions really. Um, it goes full circle, it begins with a musical idea and it's varied uh, 30 times to end up at the same place. And the variation, if you, if you get into that is, is incredibly interesting because they follow very strict mathematical rules. So, so Bach did that at the time and um, it, it actually uses some really simple sort of mechanics principles, right? And so one of them are shifts. You can imagine if you, um, if you take um, an idea, a musical idea, like a, something you play on a piano on a keyboard, uh, you can shift it and, and it creates what's called a canon. And, um, and then you can also take a melody and you can inverse it, right? You can mirror it basically to shift the, the pitches and mirror the pitches. You can reverse it, you can play it backwards, right? Or you can do both. Uh, you can do what's called a retrograde inverse, which is basically mirroring it and inverting it. And, uh, and those are some of the ideas, some of the mathematical principles um, that, that Bach uses at a local level. And there are many others actually in the Goldberg variations that are quite, quite ingenious at, at, at different, different length scales. So the question we ask, um, so what does this mean? So this actually is, is, a, is, a, is a concept that creates what's called counterpoint, where um, notes are played against notes. You can see if you, if you create a canon, uh, you don't just have a single note, you actually have now notes that hit each other and you have multiple notes played at the same time. And the same thing with this, you can create an inversion and you can shift the inversion or you can play the inversion against the original, um, the prime uh, sequence of notes and uh, you can create music through these mechanistic transactions. Um, and, and what we have discovered actually is that proteins actually lead, have a very similar feature. And what was a really mind-boggling discovery we've made in, in a couple of recent papers is that when you look at a, a protein folding um, process, it actually creates the same concept what's in music called counterpoint, um, which is uh, done the following way. You recall protein folding, right? So this protein is initially a long strand, um, disconnected amorphous, after the folding, it has assembled into a structure. And when you think about the protein now as a, a sequence of notes, right? So each amino acid is a, is a building block and uh, they can connect. Um, these um, you know, sequences actually can line up and uh, after the protein is folded. And when they line up, you have physical closeness, right? So you get this amino acid here. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to uh, turn on the, the laser pointer again. Apologies for this. So you, let's say you have an amino acid here. Now that amino acid now is physically close to this one here, which is physically close to this one here. So you can appreciate this is a very similar concept as what you see in, um, in, in music, right? You have note against note, in this case, amino acid against amino acid. And this uh, counterpoint emerges actually in, through structure, through a, a distance correlation matrix, how we call it, um, actually encodes the entire three-dimensional geometry of the protein in this space. And what it means is if you take the, uh, the protein and you create musical scores from that, you could encode the entire uh, three-dimensional structure of the protein in, in that way. So you can build a model of protein from here. Uh, and I want to talk about one more thing in a moment that is the mechanics basis for the, the individual amino acid building block 
which we don't know yet. Uh, I'll cover that in a moment later on. But but once we have that in place, we can build models of the entire structure. Now, this is a single protein, a very simple contact map. This here actually is a big protein, has a very complex uh, contact map. And you can see that this feature actually creates very interesting musical concepts, which resemble in many ways the kinds of musical constructs that composers like Bach have used in their creations, right? We can go both ways. Uh, so we can go uh, from a contact map to a protein, uh, sorry, from a protein to a contact map. And we can also go from a contact map back to a protein, right? We can go both ways. So we can actually, by going to musical uh, scores, we can go back from the musical scores and create a geometry from that again. So what that means is essentially what we can do now, we can go take a musical score like Bach, Goldberg variations, and you could ask the question, what geometric object did that composition reflect? Right, and and you can begin to ask those questions now with this tool we've developed. So this is work we're doing right now, and we we kind of begin to think, you know, um, how can we use this in the context of creating hierarchical systems? So again, the spider uses vibrations and spectral vibrations to create structures by processing information in its brain and its neural network. The human is obviously able to create um, music like Bach and Beethoven and, and many others have done. Um, and of course, we can also replace the human uh, human brain by AI, and, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So, you know, when we, we think about uh, the creation of systems in that way, we can use our brain, but we can also use artificial models of the brain, and we have done that as well. So, um, one little break here, and that is, you know, we haven't really answered, you know, how we can make the assumption of how, of why each letter of this amino acid sequence is a note. How can we hear that? I mean, you can... You can imagine it's a note, but what's the physical, the mechanical basis to this? And to answer this question, we actually spent quite a lot of time to think about molecules again. And we went back actually to, to look at benzene over time and, and realized that all the textbooks, you know, going back to 1800 are really wrong because benzene or any other molecule isn't like this. In fact, if you if you look at benzene, uh, you know, in the microscope, either a computational quantum simulation or an actual little microscope, it looks more like this. And so there's continuous vibrations of the molecules, the atoms. And um, these vibrations are very similar to what you have in the guitar, right? So, so this is a guitar, you plug the guitar and you can hear the sound emerging from that. Now, this sounded very pleasant because the guitar was tuned well. It was actually tuned according to equal tuning. And, you know, we played a certain scale that notes that work well together. Um, and so, you know, these of course notes, what you hear are pressure waves that are caused by these waves propagating. So that's sort of what I talked about earlier. The, so the basic mechanics and physics problem that you, we teach in, in, in college um, usually is you know, vibrating strings. And these uh, the sound of a vibrating string is really a collection of, of many partials of, of waves um, on top of one another, and that creates the typical sound of an instrument. Right? So these, these partials um, can be you know, seen as a Fourier analysis, Fourier analysis or synthesis can be you know, broken down like that. And uh, you, can, you can use these sine waves we talked about earlier to create any kind of complex waveform. Like in this case, you can reconstruct square waves, right? Um, you can also go the other way, and that's what we've done here. Um, and this actually is work we published in, in EML a couple of, um, actually about a year ago now. So um, we, we thought, you know, can we build um, an audible model of not just this one protein like benzene, but of any known protein, any protein known to humans today, can we build a model of that in the audible space? And can we listen to those proteins? Can we look at the vibrational spectrum? And you know, really expanding the way we can experience proteins in that sense and using mechanics. Plan. So we went in and we, we've calculated the vibrational spectrum of every known protein. And uh, this is work by Zhao, Zhao Jin, that I mentioned him earlier. Um, sorry, here we go. I'll go back to this. So he created a, a script that you know, loads the data from the PDB, um, does um, a microdynamic simulation, basically to compute the normal modes. Um, these are the independent vibrational modes that make up the more complex sound, if you wish. And then we have um, uh, you know, done this for hundreds of thousands of different proteins, um, all known proteins for modes, I think up to 64 modes. So these are just 11, but there, there are many more. The higher modes have higher frequencies. So at some point, um, you're not gonna hear them anymore, right? So there's a limit to what you need actually, but 64 was the one we used. Um, and it actually, we discovered that these modes allow us to then characterize proteins uniquely just by listening to them, right? So if you had a, imagine having a, an imaginary keyboard, right? Each key is a protein. If you play a pro, if you play a key, I can tell you what protein it was by looking at the vibrational spectrum. I can analyze the spectrum and I can actually see what it was. And so these spectra, again, are calculated based on mechanics, right? So we, we compute the vibrational motions of these molecules. Now, molecules, as you know, um, as many of you know, 
you can't really hear them because the frequencies are terrible. So how do we make them audible? And so we have a little experiment. So I don't know if you can hear it very clearly, but I'm playing something right now. And I want you to kind of listen and tell me what you hear. Any idea? I know we have no live audience maybe, but I think at this point, I think most of you are going to recognize it at this point, right? So this is for Elise by Beethoven. And, and the reason why you could hear it at some point is we've basically played the same melody on a, on a gigantic piano, but I've moved it from the right, which are high pitches, more and more to the left. And, and I've kind of played this. This is, this is the score, if you wish. And, and actually, another interesting thing, you know, to, uh, to, a, to, a, to a scientist, a score uh, is not going to look like a score, a musical score. Actually, it looks like a pattern, right? So this pattern you see here is the relationship between pitches over time. And what matters for us humans to recognize a certain melody to say this is for at least or not or something else is not where the notes are played on the keyboard. It's actually the relationship between the frequencies. You can shift them. And this shifting is called transposition. And um, the concept in music theory is called transpositional equivalence. You can, you can move sounds and music to different frequency ranges to meet you know, requirements like a choir or a human voice and other things like this. In this case, we use um, this idea to uh, make molecules audible. We shifted them, but we retained the unique spectrum of relationships between the notes, okay? And that that's allows us to do it in a self-consistent way. So now we have a way of actually, you know, modeling DNA, I mean, and proteins um, rigorously in sound. We have created a little app for this. And, and you, can actually, you can actually listen to this um, um, on a couple of websites. I can post them later. Um, you can listen to a bunch of different proteins. This app uh, actually allows you to, to scan through um, all known proteins and you can listen to them and you can explore their different vibrational modes, the contributions to the sound. Uh, you can also um, think about these as barcodes. Right? And so, so we use this now to create um, a systematic way of describing proteins in, a, in, in an audible range. So you imagine you start with a protein and, uh, and you, can, you can look at this, this structure and uh, we can actually describe the entire geometry of the protein, secondary structure, folding, and other things like this, and all our geometry, the assembly, in, in the frequency spectrum or as a musical score. Right? And so now you have that available. And uh, if you have an Android phone, um, apologies, I don't have an app, Apple version for this yet, but um, we have an Android version of this. Um, it's called the Amino Essence, as you can download it for free. You can download that, and you can actually, on your cell phone, play create new amino acids by composing melodies, right? And you can then actually check whether the melodies you've created are alpha helices or beta sheets or other kinds of proteins. So, so you know, each, each amino acid has a unique note associated with it, a new, unique barcode. And this then allows us to, to use this very effectively for machine learning applications. So when you think about protein design, um, in the very beginning of the lecture, I talked about the language, right? And you know, one of the things we don't know is what language does nature speak to make materials? We don't know that. And, and we can begin to appreciate the language maybe by, by looking at music and understanding the music composition and listening to the proteins. But it's very hard because proteins, uh, once you listen to some of the examples, sound very different than any human created music because they follow different rules, different laws, the different grammar I talked about earlier, right? So one effective way of actually uh, capturing those grammar relationships is using machine learning. We use a method called a recurrent neural network. Uh, basically is a neural network that can not classify an image, okay? But can actually predict a new sequence from an old sequence. So it's imagine uh, it's widely used for human language processing. So if you give the neural network a sentence, it give you a sentence back, gives you a response, like a bot, right? A chat bot, for instance, or something like that. Um, and we can apply this to music as well. And, uh, and actually, we can apply this to conventional music. The way you can imagine this being done is you can basically let uh, take uh, thousands of songs and you know give it to an LSTM and let the LSTM listen to it. And, and that's what comes out of it, right? So the AI can actually uh, you know, compose its own melody. We begin by a seed melody, which is the one in the beginning. And you've kind of seen the frequency spectrum going on at time. So now you're going to hear you know, what the AI has, has created from that. So it creates variations of the initial idea and it follows the rules and laws it has learned from human made music. Right? So these are all ideas that humans have come up with. Now, we've repeated this process and instead of teaching uh, the AI human made songs, which is interesting but not very relevant for material science, we have taught the AI 
uh, music that reflects proteins to, the, to this uh, true representation that we talked about for, for extensive period of time now in this talk. And so now we have um, you know, proteins, thousands of different proteins, or hundreds of thousands of different proteins potentially. Um, we can resemble them in, as a musical score, uh, give them to AI, and let the AI then um, either analyze that, characterize them, or we can let the AI create new proteins, new protein sequences. And the way this works here, this is um, uh, music actually that was created um, by an AI, listening to um, many dozens, hundreds of different coronavirus proteins. And I'll talk a little more about the coronavirus in a moment, but since we're in the middle of a pandemic, I want to show that example. So we gave the AI the, the construction plans for coronavirus proteins, and we let it create a new type of sort of emerged uh, system that resembles a, you know, a new type of coronavirus protein. And you know the way this looks like is, this is for a different system, is uh, as, a, as a score basically without listening to the, to the piece, um, you begin with a seed and you create a score, you can make protein from that. Uh, we have actually built the protein in a computer model. So we sort of went to the AI and then went back into a physical model of the protein and simulated using molecular dynamics, looked at its mechanical features and it actually analyzed the sequences predicted um, you know, against existing proteins. What we can see from this actually is that these proteins that we can generate using this method do not exist in nature. So some, under some conditions, we make proteins that nature has also invented, but we can also make proteins that nature has not yet invented, but that actually exist, right? So, so we can make these proteins in a computer or in the lab. Um, we can design all sorts of different proteins. Um, the application we have, we have a project with IBM and the MIT AI lab at Quest um, to make uh, protein design proteins using AI for food coatings to increase shelf life of food. So that's one of the applications of this. Uh, drug design is another one. We also have a COVID project where we're trying to use this methodology to create antibodies. Uh, and that's why we're studying these uh, COVID um, spike proteins actually and, and creating a uh, representation of these in the AI model using the musical representation. Um, and we can make them, as I mentioned, we can make them in the lab. So these actually are real. So they have materialized. So when I actually ha had this in my hands, I was really amazed by that because basically we went from an abstract idea of of a you know a PDB data right of, of thousands of proteins um, to creating a new protein that we have seen in a computer model and then we made that protein in the lab and actually held it in our hands and so we've materialized the sound um, which ultimately came from the material right so we have been able to sort of use that idea that I outlined earlier of using sound as a way of manipulating things um, yeah and I and really quickly um, some of you might might have seen that um, we've also um, sonified or created a musical representation of the coronavirus spike protein. So this is uh, the coronavirus that everyone has seen you know, many times. Um, this guy here is the, it's called a spike protein. And these are the little spikes that actually stick out of the, pro out, out of the, the, the sphere, okay? And that's what infects the human cell. And what we've done is, this is a very interesting protein. I, I, when I saw it, I, I was intrigued by it because it's a very interesting folding pattern. You can see, you know, knowing about the relationship between uh, protein folding and counterpoint and music and certification and, and all the different things we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, I was amazed by it. And, and I actually was trying to find a way of, of translating this stuff, which is, this is a genetic sequence, which is um, just a bunch of data you can never comprehend as a human, um, or that is another representation of a small piece of it, into a musical score. And, and what came out of that was, you know, incredible piece actually that is about two hours long because the protein is gigantic, right? So it's a very big protein. And if you're interested in listening, you can go to that, that, that website and I'll, I can post it on, on, the, on the, the chat later as well. Um, you can listen to all, a bunch of different sonifications of proteins there as well. But that, um, what you hear now is a reflection, a true reflection of this protein um, in, in musical space. And, and it has all the information about how that protein unfolds. And it goes about, about two hours long. The way the sounds were created, by the way, you know, true to because I'm, you know, we're material scientists, mechanicians. We we want to create the sounds. Uh, you know, when we render the sounds uh, using a computer, we uh, we actually use a method called physical modeling. So what you heard actually, most of the sounds in there are created using this process, where we actually literally simulate the process of vibrating strings. Now the tension of the strings are affected by the pitch, which reflect the different amino acids. And um, this allows us to have a sort of a physics-based approach to rendering the sound as well. And, and again, just to summarize, this, um, this, uh, these uh, sonification methods allow us to you know, really build these analogies between amino acids, materials, and music, and, and so forth. And the last example I want to show, um, I know we're almost out of time, is um, 
kind of the other way around, we've also done become really interested in, um, in you know in, in, in work to understand how we can make sound into matter uh, through mechanical actuations of reversing hearing or maybe actually making hearing accessible to our eyes. And, and that's a you know actually a really important feature, I think, in, in human evolution. If we think about the um, the way humans have evolved or many insects have evolved, we really have to provide understand the context in which we live. And and for humans, water and many animals, water is very important. And so the way we have actually discovered uh, water is we're very good at detecting water waves reflecting in the sky. And, and you can see that if you, you hike um, or you go to the beach, um, there's a fascination that humans have with that. And, and I think it's because um, we're drawn to that because we need it for survival. And, and what's uh, very interesting, you know, this is a, a picture of a lake um, and, or a river. And, and you can hear, you can see in this picture how the, the water surface, which is supposed to be flat, of course, is mechanically actuated by, in this case, wind blowing, right? Create surface patterns. Uh, this is a little movie that shows this in a little more detail. As you can see, these waves propagating in a, in a lake at night. Um, there's a slight wind loading, there's insects in there flying, there's swimming in there, there's fish in there, and you know, it creates these patterns of waves. And so, what I thought is, you know, can we utilize this idea of water waves because they're so fundamental in the human evolution? Um, to build models of proteins in that representation. Right? And so we actually um, went back and, and I, I remember that Ti Gang, I think you always um, tell everyone, you know, read the old papers, right? And so I have a, a really old book here, a really old reference, and it's uh, by Chalatni and others. And you might have seen that. Um, it's, um, it's a book that was published so long ago that it actually was written, it had a Kupfertal, it's a German book, and it's, it, had, it had some um, pictures, um, I think, you know, uh, created in, in copper plates. So you, um, uh, I don't have a copy of the book, I only have online versions of it, but but it is quite quite an amazing um, you know, piece of work, very old. And what Chalatni did actually, he used uh, a model of liquid, not, not water in this case, but he used sand um, to understand how vibrations, how sound waves affect patterns of sand forming uh, in, in the system. So he had a whole exploration of this um, and, uh, and that's become a whole field of study actually over, over the last couple of centuries. So we use this idea but instead of actuating um, sand, um, we actually actuated water. And the way we did this is we, um, we created, uh, we took a little Petri dish, put an uh, acoustic actuator in there. Uh, that, that Petri dish has a little water film in there with a camera on the top. And you know, we, we amplify a sound source. And the sound source we're using, you might have guessed it. What is it? Well, it's because it's protein. Right? So we actually play different proteins and the spectrum of different proteins. And we want to see what kind of water patterns can we see and can we distinguish the proteins just by looking at a water wave patterns. And, and actually, it's something that worked you know, amazingly well. So we went, so that's the flow chart, basically determine the molecular vibration of spectra. I've talked a lot about that. But we have done this for all proteins known. So we have a lot of data on this. And then we collected you know, a couple of different proteins we were interested in, small proteins, big proteins, the COVID proteins, because this is during the pandemic. So we, we looked at many different kinds of, in fact, we actually looked at a, 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 a COVID spike protein attached to the ACE2 receptor of the human cell and detached from the human cell. And, and, and they studied those um, and, and took images, uh, trained the machine learning model because it turns out the human eye is very is not very good in detecting these patterns. Like to us, many of these wave patterns look very similar. Um, so we basically said, you know, why don't we use a machine learning uh, image characterization method for that um, and then tested that. And so this is by the way how these waves look like. So these wave patterns of the protein uh, turned by the protein book like this is a bigger view, that's a smaller view. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting details in there. Um, and, and by the way, and this is sort of the, I mean, remind you, the origin of these wave patterns are these frequency spectra from the proteins, right? Um, and, you know, this is an example of a protein that is bound, this is a spike protein from this coronavirus we're dealing with right now, bound to the human cell, that's the human cell receptor on the outside of the human cell, that's not bound to it. And you can see the spectrum is actually very similar, but slightly different. You can actually hear the difference too, right? Um, but um, you can also see the difference in the patterns. And so this is the result of the uh, machine learning algorithm is able to, uh, in this case, I think we had something like 10 or 11 different test cases, um, is able to characterize very well, you know, which protein has caused the vibration. And so again, we did that in, in, the, in the typical way. We, we trained it, we validated, tested it, and we validated it by, by giving it new sounds, taking photos, and then checking whether these uh, these pictures of associated with the new sounds can be detected and associated with certain proteins, and it matches really well. So each of these spikes, it's a radar plot. Right? So you know how to read that, so so you can see that this protein is the one on the previous slide. Six M seventeen is the um, the, the human uh, cell receptor alone. Six M eighteen is the human cell receptor with the COVID protein attached to it. And even though they're very similar, the 
algorithm can detect differences very, very, very carefully. Um, another thing that um, the last thing is, you know, when you when you have image classification like this, um, a lot of times we don't know what's going inside or inside the network. We do to actually understand the mechanics of the resonances inside is we use an algorithm that um, was initially developed by Google, um, the Deep Dream algorithm, which with with approximate with uh, um, changed a little bit to, uh, you know, create um, a deep dream algorithm version to detect protein waves in different pictures. And so we can detect um, protein waves in images like water waves, which is made to be, but we can also detect these patterns in other images. Like we can ask the question, you know, what kind of resonances can be identified in a picture of a, of a coastal area, like in Rock, Rockport Mass here, um, or in Switzerland, um, or in many other places around the world. So you can kind of see how resonances can be highlighted and features found. And so this is a way of looking in the internal deep layers of the protein uh, structure of the neural network. So concluding, um, so I, know I went through a lot of different things, but I, um, the, the, the takeaway, one of the takeaways is that, you know, all the things we see in nature are based on this interplay of universality and diversity, right? So we have these, you know, very simple building blocks like stiffness and softness or, you know, different vibrations, different tones, 20 unique amino acids. And to create function, we can assemble these in different ways and, and actually create enormous diversity and complexity in function. And it's a very different paradigm than engineering today, right? In engineering today, uh, we use either steel or that plastic or this plastic or that concrete or this concrete. We use different materials to build things, but nature doesn't do that, right? Nature uses the same stuff to build everything. And, and that's sort of a really amazing paradigm, I think, that we can utilize and learn from. And with that, I uh, want to thank you um, for your attention and um, happy to answer any questions. Wow, great. Uh, so uh, can you uh, please um, unshare your Terribly uh, great. Please take it over. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Marcus, for a very impressive and ins inspiring talk. Uh, now I would like to open it up to the uh, audience and panelists for questions and discussion. I think for the panelists, you might not have the raise uh, hand function. Uh, you can raise your. Uh, um, you can just raise. You can just virtually raise your hand. And then uh, for the audience, you should have uh, on the bottom next to Q and A and chat button. You should have a raise hand. Uh, button that you can press. Um, and yeah, when, um, uh, when you're called on, if you can introduce, if you can introduce yourself and say where, where you're from, that'd be a really great. And uh, I think I'm gonna start off with um, uh, from the panelists, uh, Shouting, who has a question. And then I think there's two questions also in the chat that we can go on to next. Is Shouting, are you still here? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Professor Masbuller, this is Shouting from MIT. Hi. Actually, I have attended uh, many of your talks, and also I attended your summer courses as a listener previous, previously. <laughs> very nice talk and uh, inspiring talk. Thank you very much. So I'm, uh, my question actually is about your three-dimensional spider web. So uh, I'm pretty interested in the geometric factors, how these factors are impact on mechanical properties. So particularly, the uh, factors may include the uh, heterogeneous le fiber lenses or mm -hmm. the non-uniform densities of fibers in the three-dimensional spaces. Mm -hmm. And also even for each junctions, it may connect it to three or four. So it's such mm -hmm. a different kind of connectivities. Yep. So the question is how these kind of factors affect the elasticity of fractures. So this is question one. The second question is, I also noticed you mentioned 3D printing such kind of fibers at a relative or a slightly larger scale. Uh, in uh, analogy to such a scale, actually even small scale, let's say go down to nano scale, uh, uh, also have some similar structures on a polymer network or hydrogels, but of different nature. So my question, the second question is about how such a kind of lenses, lens skills plays a role uh, in terms of mechanical properties. Yeah, well, wow, awesome question. So the first one, uh, you know, some, you know, some, some relationships of how the, the detailed organization of the fibers affect mechanics, I, we have done, I showed it in the, actually it's in the recent uh, JMPS paper and then the the other paper that I've showed actually is in review right now at EML uh, on the machine learning model, where we have looked at many different, um, well, six different microstructural features. Uh, some of the ones are the ones you mentioned, um, not all the ones we've captured, we actually looked only at local effects like um, average connectivity, orientation of fibers and things like this and density and so on. Um, but yeah, I mean, your, your suggestion of looking at how these vary in space at a next level up 
and how they affect the mechanics is a great one. I think that's something we should explore. Uh, we should we could map that out actually and then model that. Um, but yeah, so so you know, so in a, in a method, you know, we we're beginning to explore that and have done some of that. So stay tuned. I mean, take a look at the uh, JMPS paper that just came out, and then take you know stay tuned for the EML paper. Hopefully, hopefully to be ex sure. hopefully accepted. I don't know yet, but <laughs> that's in review. Um, and the, the second question about printing, yeah. So you know, for the the prints we made are all micro scale enough. Um, we we can't really print. We're not a, a you know an advanced 3D printing lab, and um, and we we have some multi material printers. We have some uh, resin based printers. We have the the, um, the filament printers that we use for the for the biomass based uh, you know kind of things. But um, but yeah, that's an area if if. Some of you are doing 3D printing for a living, basically. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to talk, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things we could do in, in printing at smaller scales. Uh, I, I think as you go to the nano scale uh, more and more, it's gonna become more and more difficult to create structures. So what the spider does, I mean, you can look at what this, a lot of times we can now look at nature and how they, how nature does it. And the way the spider does it, it has nano features in there, obviously but it, it does it by self-assembling the proteins in its body and then using the microfluidic technologies basically to, to extrude the filaments. Um, and then the, 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 the way the 3D printing is used, the, the spider being a 3D printer itself, right, um, yeah. is used at a micro scale enough, right? So it doesn't bother trying to make nanostructures even printing. It actually uses its own body to make that. And, and I think for the human uh, technology, it's probably going to be something like that as well. So I always think that there's going to be a you know a range of different techniques we need to make these things. But but yeah, I mean I I would love to talk. You know, if, if any one of you or you are interested in in printing, we have um, we have a lot of data. Um, we're we're actually mining the data in various ways. I've shown some of that in this talk. Um, there's a lot more we can do um, in understanding these relationships and what's in the web. It, it's incredibly complex. Um, as I said, so you look. You next time you see a, a cobweb, you know you can still destroy it if you want, but but appreciate it for a moment because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, and, and we don't understand a lot of these things. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot to mine. So I'm happy to talk to anyone who um, specializes in you know maybe in, in filament mechanics or in, in structural analysis, topology, the mathematical models and characterization, factor dimensions. We've done some of that, but there's a lot more we can do. So we'd we'd love to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Um, uh, uh, Daniel Cosgrove uh, from the panelists. Um, I know you. I noticed that you have a. You put a question to the chat. Do you want to introduce yourself and? All right. Uh, yes. You? Hi, Marcus. Uh, inspiring talk. Um, I had a, a, a question that's a little bit off to the side, maybe, but uh, maybe you can give a quick answer to it. I was wondering about the stickiness of the web fibers. And uh, it seemed to me that that has a potential for, for uh, creating, uh, changing the, di the, the structure of the web by causing lateral association of, of fibers. And I'm wondering if that was explored at all in your modeling and if you actually model that aspect of, of yeah. fibers. Yeah, interesting. No, we, we haven't, we haven't uh, well, the, the model right now is, is basically models the, the actual web that the spider has made. So there's no, um, well, other than maybe breaking it, you know, there's no change to that. Um, in the, you know, the simulation of the prey, there's some uh, interaction of the prey with the web, right? So, so that's included, but there's no, um, there's no, um, you know, modeling of the process by which the web is actually made. And, and if, yeah, if we wanted to do that, we would have to include the stickiness of the, of the, of the spider silk for sure. Um, and that's going to affect it. So yeah, in a way you can imagine this web to be, you know, the way it's built with all the effects of this crap included and better than that. But, but yeah, we could include that. Um, um, fundamentally there's no, there's no challenge to that. Um, but we basically had an as is constructed web in, in the way we're looking at here. But you're right, um, you know, as you deform the web heavily, uh, you're going to have some association potentially that, that if you wanted to capture those, we would have to include these interactions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Ting Chi Liu. Um, hello. Uh, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Marcus. Uh, thank you for the talk. I am a student of Professor Shu Weizang, and uh, okay. and in the <laughs> in the real world, we will to the instrument to make them sounds comfortable. And uh, if we can map the protein to the sound, does the microscopy world have uh, the same tuning mechanism? If yeah. yes, what 
what is, is the purpose of it? Yeah, that's that's an amazing question. I mean, yeah, well, so I mean, looking at the spider web itself, so we I did not show this, but we have done uh, we're doing with Tomas. I uh, seen actually done some work on on uh, we've recorded um, the you know the, the vibrations created by the spider under different activities and uh, you know like uh, like um, prey catching, attracting mates, um, you know checking the integrity of the web, um, you know, probing the web, and so on. And we have a pretty good idea of, you know, what are the kind of sound spectra and, and histories um, associated with these activities. So there's some, um, some relationship between what the spider does in actuation and what it gets back, right? And how it communicates with other species. Um, now, what that is, I don't know, but, but obviously the spider is in tune to that, right? So the spider's um, neural network processes this information. So to the spider, that tuning makes sense and it understands how changes in tension or lack of fibers change the way the signals are transduced through the web. Um, but we don't know yet how that works or what the mechanics behind that is. And that's something we're, like I said, we're actively exploring now. So we're interested in, in understanding. So I think the way I always put it is, you know, from a simple perspective now in the beginning, let's put a sound effect, sound uh, actuator on one end of the spider web and have a, a, a sensor on the other end, right? And you know what kind of transduction do we have, and what if we cut some filaments? How does that change, right? So begin to see that. Um, we also have done some work where we we uh, we use um, we have all these recordings of spiders classified by activities. We train uh, a similar method actually we use for the music proteins uh, model to be able to generate um, words in the language of spiders. So uh, and that relates to your question. So we actually can now. I can now, by, by hitting a button on my keyboard, I can make um, mating, mate attracting sounds on my keyboard and I can play that back to the spider. So these are synthetically generated sounds, right? That sound just like the ones the spider makes, but they're different, they're unique, they're generated based on the classifier, uh, classified generator uh, in, um, in LSTM model. So, so that's something we can do. But yeah, I think the, yeah, there, there is sort of, a, so I think that in a nutshell, there's a tuning that the spider understands. Um, we don't know what it is, but that's what it, so if we were to retune the, the spider up to sound like a guitar, I think the spider would probably die because it would be very confused. Just like the human ear is very confused when we look, when we listen to the spider, it doesn't make any sense to us, right? And that's why, I mean, in a, in a, in the, some of the, you know, the work we've done at the University of Art and Science, we, we use this idea of, of pushing the, uh, the structure, the, the, the amorphous tuning into the equal temperament tuning or harmonic tuning um, to, to sort of begin to straddle that dividing line between what we as humans, at least culturally in, 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 our, in our ears and our brains understand as pleasant and what the spider sees. And, and we see that as a way of, of beginning to understand that different language, but, but it is at the very early stages. But it's a very deep question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Guy. Um, hey, Marcus. It's, it's a, an honor to hear a talk from a true rock star in the world of spiders. So the, the sp spider women consider you the greatest rock star ever. But I, I have a, a big picture question about metal ions. And so one of the ways that nature tunes, our bodies tune certain proteins, is by throwing in a, a metal ion that, mm -hmm. that, that, that interacts with the rest of the toolbox they've created, like met, uh, matrix of metalloproteinases are a mm -hmm. classic example. Yeah. What, what is the status of being able to add in metal ions into this huge, beautiful toolbox that you've created? Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we, um, one of my graduate students, so, uh, so I would say stay tuned. Uh, actually, it's Isha Kare, who's, I don't know if she's on, 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 on Zoom, but uh, she's a new grad student. And uh, Isha has been working on exactly that question. So, you know, we, we have actually worked on, um, on metals and proteins a couple of years ago um, with a group at AFRL. Um, because metal ions added to that, like you say, toolbox creates a really interesting additional knob you can tune, right? So you have now, you know, not only pH or secondary structure or sequence, but you have an ability to, you know, take an existing protein that's been made, like like collagen or um, or sub protein, and if you add a metal ion, you fundamentally change the interactions. And if you can exchange these metal ions, or you can play with them, exchange or increase the concentrations you can really fundamentally change the mechanical features. So, so it's sort of a, uh, to me, uh, you know, another type of chemical bond that is, is reversible, it's weak, but it's a little stronger than hydrogen bonds, but it has a very strong tunability effect. 
And yeah, so Isha and, uh, and with Niels Holt and Anderson, who some of you might know on the experimental side, we're working together on that. And it's a big push in our lab right now, actually, to move into that area because uh, we think that beyond the hydrogen bond secondary structures and folding, that is one of the unexplored areas of how molecular interactions and proteins work. And, and as you mentioned, they also play a very important role in the, in the, in the, in the enzymatic world of cleaving collagen and, and other molecules as well. So that's a, I think from a mechanics perspective, let's put it that way, um, there's very little known about how metal ions added to a protein affect the mechanics. Um, and, and it's, it's, but it's an exciting direction, I think, for, for mechanicians to go into because it provides tunability. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Zhen Jia from the panel. Hi, Professor Builder. Uh, thanks for the very inspiring talk. And uh, this is Zheng Jia, an assistant professor from Zhejiang University, China. I, I was a former PhD student of Professor Tang Li. And today my question is about the hydrogen bonds. So uh, because uh, the spider silk is, uh, is very strong and tough uh, because it contains a lot of hydrogen bonds. Mm -hmm. And we know some other materials in nature like the cellulose materials also uh, contains a lot of hydrogen bonds and they are also very strong and tough. Uh, but in contrast, uh, many artificial materials like hydrogels usually depend on um, uh, like physical bonds or chemical bonds to mm -hmm. achieve high toughness. So my question is, uh, why does nature uh, love the weak hydrogen bonds so much? And how can we learn from nature to use the weak hydrogen bonds to build strong engineering materials in future? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I, I think the answer is, um, so why, why uh, you know, this is um, hydrogen bond you know, based material like silk much stronger than hydrogen? The reason is the organization of the bonds. So the way, uh, you know, proteins as a platform, uh, and that's why I am very interested in proteins because of that, because I think it's a, it's a really interesting way of, of organizing nanostructures in a, in a programmable way, basically, right? So, you know, and you can do some of that with DNA as well, of course, you can make DNA and nanostructures and DNA origami and other things, but DNA aren't, isn't used a lot, or maybe at all, I don't know, as a construction material in the human body, it's an information carrier. But proteins are really the way materials are made in our human body. And so it's the real stuff, basically. That's how nature builds us, right? And so, yeah, and, and, but in proteins, uh, rather than DNA, you can, you, can, you can program any nanostructure by engineering a sequence. That's why we're spending so much time in understanding, you know, relations between a sequence or a word spoken in protein language and what is the structure that forms, what's the, the function, which could be strength or toughness or extensibility. And, and, and you can program that very accurately. And so what we've shown, and I did this at a very early in the beginning of the talk, but I, and if you, you know, I'm happy to send you some of those papers that were referenced early on too. Um, there was a series of papers that, you know, I, Sinan, and then later um, uh, with Steve and others published on, uh, and Zhao as well, um, in, in, you know, in, in various journals in different settings, where we looked at how uh, groups of hydrogen bonds in different organizations work mechanically. And, and so it turns out that if you, if you don't organize them, um, they lose their strength, okay? And so they, they're, like, they're like liquids. And that's why a gel um, cannot rely on, a hydrogel cannot rely on hydrogen bonds because we don't have the ability to really organize the hydrogen bonds well. So we need a back, you know, backstop, which is basically the, the safety, we call the safety line, which are covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are, we can make them as engineers, but they're a really bad idea for nature because, um, so Guy was asking about collagen, Nature needs a way to break things down, right? So if you have a bone and it needs to be able to fix the bone and, and basically de delete a piece of bone and make it new, right? Or change its shape. And, and if you have covalent bonds, it's very hard to do um, and very expensive to do. Um, and, and that's why nature doesn't use that. Uh, engineers, we can do it. We have a lot of energy still, right? So we can do it. But, um, but yeah, so nature uses this, that's why they're sort of stuck on using hydrogen bonds and proteins as a way of creating organization because it allows nature to build, like I said in the beginning, almost anything out of that, these 20 amino acids, right? You can make, um, if you think about it, if you, uh, you know, think about any material, uh, human-made material that can do that, right? So imagine making a material that can build a circuit, like a brain, right, a, a circuitry, that can build a strong material like silk, bone, that can build an engine, a motor, like a protein motor. We, we use many different materials to do that. But nature uses for all these different functions, right? From building a, an engine, a motor, an enzyme, building a nerve cell, building a neural network, 
it's all based on the same chemical substance. And that's the idea of universality, right? So you can build diversity and function out of universal building blocks. And the reason is, of course, that it's like when I when we talked about the spider web and the and the sound and, and moving the, the amorphous sound into the structure. When you eat a when you eat food, let's say you probably at night so you eat breakfast tomorrow, you eat an egg, right? Um, and and you know the egg has all sorts of stuff in it, and your body is not going to grow an egg, right? I mean it's it, it's going to grow maybe hair or skin or you know an organ. And the way it does it, it takes the stuff in the egg and it breaks it down into these twenty building blocks because the egg itself is made from those building blocks. Right. And, and among other things, but the, the amino acids are in there. And so that's the way nature can actually recycle everything. And, and that's sort of the reason why it works. Now, there's a price to pay, and the price to pay is it takes long, right? It's very slow. But so you know that in, when you grow bone, it takes a long time. Um, even though spiders can print pretty quickly, but they cannot make huge amounts of silk. So, so it takes a long time. So there's a price to pay, and one of them is, is time. Um, but but we're hopeful that um, you know with advancement in technology we, we're going to be able to speed up this process. So hopefully we can make more material quicker, cheaper, with less energy. And 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 the you know those of you who are in the in, in the lab at MIT, my lab, you know that I always talk about you know building an airplane from sand, from glass, right? So if we were to be able to um, you know take sand, rocks, and you know build an airplane from that, that would be amazing, right? So and, and nature does that actually. So you think about seashells. They, uh, they, they basically use um, you know, silica and um, they grow their own bodies from that and they make one of the, actually uh, Grace studied, uh, had a, has an amazing paper um, on conch shells. If you haven't seen it, you should look it up, um, um, where you know, it's one of the toughest materials known and it, it's made from silica and a little bit of organic matter. And, and you know, these, uh, these are examples where nature can use something as mundane as sand to make something you know, incredibly tough which we don't do yet, right? So to us to make a material like this, we need a steel plant, um, maybe a ceramic plant, a lot of energy, and, and it's fine if you have it, but well, maybe we wanna use a different avenue in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, next is Yu Hang. Thank you, Grace. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, uh, Professor Bueller, for the beautiful talk. Uh, Yu Han Hu from Georgia Tech. I was uh, Qigong's uh, former PhD student. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, uh, I have a, a, a question about the property of the spider silk. So you talk about this uh, vibration uh, behavior of uh, the web that uh, uh, spider use to uh, uh, get a sense of uh, signals. So this is very useful. I think uh, uh, in order to get uh, um, uh, to realize that function, you want the material to be elastic, right? And uh, but uh, 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 on the other hand, the uh, spider will also want to catch the uh, uh, fly, and mm. when the fly impact the uh, spider web. Uh, you don't want it to generate a lot of uh, uh, vibration. You also want to have a dissipation mechanisms in it. So I think maybe there is an optimization of the uh, viscoelastic or dissipation uh, properties in the uh, spider silk. Have you thought about that? And do you have any comments on that? No, that's interesting. Um, it's definitely a viscoelastic material. Uh, we, we haven't studied it yet. Um, but but it, yeah, it should be studied absolutely, and I think um, and it, maybe some others have. I'm pretty sure people have looked at that. I know that it has been demonstrated, but I don't know what they've done with that. But yeah, it's definitely true. And you know, in, in a way, you need the dissipation to get rid of the mechanical energy of the vibrations at some point. Otherwise, I mean, it would vibrate maybe too long, or it would, it would create a lot of perturbations if, if wind blows. So there's definitely some damping built in, and. That is an important part of the, the design of the material as well. Yeah, we, we just haven't studied that, but um, but that is clearly important. Yeah, and I hope that others will pick that up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Roy Bing Bai. Hi, Professor Bueller. Uh, this is Robin. I used to work with Chigang as a PhD. I'm now a postdoc at Caltech. I will be moving back to Boston in Northeastern next January. Okay. So uh, I have two questions. One of them has been uh, sort of answered before, but uh, so about the first one is about the wave. And we know one uh, fascinating feature of a musical instrument is that not only the linear waves, but also when 
you know, two frequencies in, interplay with each other, you can have biharmonic or uh, overtone waves. So how does that work with spiders? And furthermore, how do you foresee any relation with the molecular structures in your design? And then the second question is about the design. So when the, when the spider was testing its, uh, its cob way, uh, its, its, its weaving structure, there's no way the spider can, can feel a, a, a global picture of the web it's, it's building, but it might be uh, still working already very, pretty much very well by testing local response. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, of course, as engineer, we can do better jobs by designing, uh, by looking at the global picture, but how better can we achieve compared to spider? Yeah, so I mean, the first question, the, um, in the sound, the sound of the spider web, we, um, we actually, we created uh, just a single fundamental harmonic for each, fi for each filament. And, and you're right, and I, I, I think I mentioned it in passing, you know, when you, when you have a real string vibrating, you're gonna have not just one wave, you have multiple frequencies overlaying. And, and actually, and like you said, they're, um, they're not actually, they're not always multiples integers, they're sometimes slight variations, which gives the unique characteristic timbre of an instrument. Um, but yeah, in the, in the web, we ignore that, that actually. So each each string is just a single sine wave. Um, and the complexity comes from these thousands of sine waves interacting, right? So, so it's, it's sort of like in a real instrument where you have these nonlinear effects, but but each each string, um, you know, in reality would have overtones as well and, 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 other, and other interactions between them. So, so that could be done. Uh, we just haven't done this yet. Um, the uh, the second question about the um, the design. So, you know, what I always and I mentioned a couple of times. You know, we uh, and I showed it in one of the slides. We can actually a lot of times we as engineers can do um, as humans. We can do we can make better things in nature, right? Because we don't have the constraints. So once we um, you know have figured out how silk works, we can make a, an even stronger silk or more elastic silk or have you know optical properties built in. We can do all these things that nature can't do. Um, and that's the whole point of this is I think we want to understand the, the principles and then, you know, go and go and take some of the principles we like and, you know, and, and add engineering ideas to that. And, and actually, we don't have the constraints. So, you know, spider only can make silk, but we have done in some of the work, as some of you know, uh, we use silk and we combined it with elastin. Actually, Anna worked on that, selps, right? So, so you can take two proteins that come from you know, that never actually interacted before because our human body has elastin in the lung tissue and you have spider silk in the silk in the spider web, but we can actually combine them because we can, we can express them together. And now we create a composite that has both of them included. That's a very powerful paradigm for tissue engineering applications. So we can do a lot better than nature, um, but in the same in the web. So we haven't explored that yet, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, so in fact, the web is to me is a canvas with ideas. I, I mean, you, you can, um, the work that um, Asia did on, on exploring the design of a footbridge from the spider web, um, I don't think we're going to take the web and, you know, literally take the web and make a, make a bridge out of that or a building. Um, rather, we're going to take some of the design ideas from that and then optimize them further. In fact, what she did in her thesis actually is take the web as, as is, you know, from nature and, and optimize the nodes using some um, topology-like optimization, actually, to, to make it even better. And so, so now you, you have a, a merger between them. The other thing we've been doing, and I, I, we haven't published this yet, is actually on the last slide, I showed some of the, the GANs work. So we're also using um, neural networks very heavily now in, 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 in getting the ideas into a mathematical format and then projecting them in a different domain. In other words, if you wanted to uh, you know, make a web that isn't an actual cube that is actually on a sphere or within a sphere, we can do that using neural networks. So those are some of the ideas. And, and even when you do that, um, yeah, you're gonna be able to optimize them. And if you optimize them for a certain purpose, they're probably gonna perform better than what the spider has made. I think nature isn't creating optimal structures. Okay, Th that's, a, that's a common misconception actually that a lot of times people will, will go in and they say, well, um, you know, nature's optimized, let's, let's copy it. I, I, I try to talk a lot about in the talk about the, the UDP, which is really the paradigm. I mean, we, we're not gonna just literally copy the web and make, yeah, building from it. 
Um, but we can take some of the ideas. And one of the ideas I think is very powerful that's trans trans translatable is the idea of this building block interaction and creating functional diversity from these interacting building blocks. And these mechas, mechanisms, so a lot of that is, is uh, it's not actually in, in, in the lab using now neural networks before we use category theory um, with mathematical analytical tools to, um, and there's a couple of papers, if you, you can find them, uh, I can send them to you, um, but we've demonstrated that. And, and it's basically to say, we call it the building block replacement problem, right? So, so you wanna have a paradigm of how do you create toughness or resilience, right? Um, you can learn that in nature, and then you wanna create resilience in, in, a, in a brick wall, right? How would you do that, right? You're not gonna make resilience literally out of spider silk, but you're gonna make it using some of the mechanisms you found. And, and I think in the web structure, I would look at it in a similar way, right? So you can kind of keep the connectivity and you can ask the question, how would I move the nodes? Or even how would I combine different regions? So some of you were asking earlier about, uh, I think one of the first questions was the gradients in, in the microstructure in the web. Um, you know, the, the web itself has a gradient, right? Um, and and so, so how does that affect the property? So, so you can go beyond that, I, I totally. I mean, it's not like the web is optimized. It, it's optimized for the, so one of the, some of the biologists in, in, in MIT tell me nature only adapts so it can survive, you know, as a species, right? And so, so as long as the spider can survive, it's done. It's not gonna make a better web just to make a better web. Humans are a little different, you know, we have a huge ego. You know, we wanna make, um, you know, make things better and better, even though we don't need them, right? We're gonna make the buildings taller, even though we might not need them taller. But, but I think spiders are very modest and most animals in nature are very modest. <laughs> they, um, they only adapt and optimize until they can survive, the species can survive, and then they, they live happily ever after, basically. So that's something else to learn from nature, by the way, I think, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bueller. Um, next is Professor uh, Paulino. I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Yeah, it is correct. Uh, thank you. Uh, Marcus, great to see you in the very nice talk. Yeah. I, I have two questions. Uh, I have many questions, but I will only ask two in the interest of time, and they are brief. Uh, the first one is more of a comment. Uh, one thing that I noticed is that uh, most of the people that are here today that are listening to you uh, tend to use the left side of their brain. And uh, I compliment you for uh, using uh, both sides of your brain in your research, both the left and the right. And uh, my question for you is the following. Uh, since, uh, as I indicated, uh, most of us here use the left side of our brain a lot, uh, when you give uh, your talks, uh, have you given the talks to people that are using mostly their right side of the brain? And which kind of feedback do you get? Yeah, no, I have. I mean, I, I have. Um, and yeah, I think we, I think we talked briefly about that also at the SES meeting. Now you, you got to have, you know, if you talk to a, a community of, um, you know, of artists, say, um, or people that are more creative, and you know, they, um, they're going to respond very differently, and they're going to be interested in different things. Okay. Um. So, for instance, I think, for, you know, for for an engineer, um, the fact that we have a spider web as a musical instrument is not very interesting, probably, right? I mean, you might. You, you might not really care about them. I mean, other than maybe the, the, the signal construction um, idea and maybe doing some theory on that. But, but for a musician or for um, you know, somebody who composes and writes music or, or as an artist, that's really interesting because it gives them a new canvas. I mean, you can um, you know, imagine that you know, in that community, you know, having a spider web as an instrument is extremely exciting because you can create sounds out of a spider web you could never get out of a violin or a piano, okay? <laughs> So, so that is sort of an example, right, for you know, different appreciations. Um, I, I think, you know, for this audience, I was trying to moderate this by basically saying, and I think it's important to know that, you know, mechanics has been really important in creating musical instruments. So we're actually, the mechanicians are the, 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 the legwork for anyone to actually be able to make sounds. And, and I think in the next generation of instruments, um, we can also play an important role because we can make sounds that are physics-based but that you've never heard. And, and that's seen that applies to the proteins, the molecules, that applies to the spider web. Because uh, you know, a lot of times, of course, you can make um, you can make any sound you want using synthesis. You can make you know anything you can imagine or not imagine, but it's not based on physics, right? It's based on, on some you know wild you know imagination. So in, in art, you 
like in like in engineering, you want a constraint. And so the constraint that the sound is is going to be made from some physical principle is actually very important. Otherwise, um, there's no constraint, and art cannot be created with that without that. So so that is uh, something that that community is also really interested in. And I have a follow up on that, Marcus. And again, forgive me, this might be my uh, ignorance in music, but uh, every time you talk about music, uh, I understand from you that it's something unique. You talk about the note, and uh, that bothers me. And let me explain why. Because I don't think that music is unique. Since we have uh, many uh, Chinese people here, for example, uh, let's talk about the Chopin competition. For you to get to the Chopin competition, all of them play Chopin extremely well. But uh, what makes Yun Di Li the youngest ever winner and interpreter of uh, the Chopin uh, competition is his interpretation. So the music cannot be that unique. What uh, have you thought about including that element of the interpretation of the known uniqueness of the finesse uh, the art uh, in the research right well i mean you know at the end of the day when you when you talk about the what you're talking about is not so much the um you know the, the, there's a mathematical description of the creation of, of of whatever you you write okay and you know you we can analyze that using the math and the, the physics and the principles behind that and then there's the um you know the act of actually creating the sound using the human body right let's say um, and that could be either by playing an instrument or, or through, through a model or some, some whatever it is, like a spider web as well. It's played by a human. And that, that process really connects, you know, the physical action of your, your hands, or your arms, your legs, your body, whatever, um, you know, the sound you make. And that relationship between that, that action and the brain um, adds another dimension. That's what you call, you know, performance. So that obviously has an effect on, on the way we perceive music. Um, and I didn't talk about this, you know, I didn't talk about the, um, the emotional side of that or, or non-emotional side or the response of the brain. I mean, I did show one picture of the, the fact that there is, there is a response, a physical response of the brain, um, but I didn't talk about what it is and, and how it's affected by different kinds of things. Um, so I didn't cover that, um, but, um, but that is, um, you know, in, in a way it is um, another degree of freedom that, you know, a lot of times is, is actually expressed in, you know, in some of those, you imagine the score is, is, a, is a basic idea of how to play. And then you don't play it exactly like this, right? Um, you do a very, you have a variation to that. And the variations are in, in a dimension of timing, uh, dimension of the way the sound is created, right? So, so it's not just a single pitch, it's, you know, there's a um, degree of freedom in a violin of pressure, of speed, of velocity and so on. So those are things that come in and, and that's where I think if you, if you see a score, um, there's a degree of freedom that's not captured in a score, um, that's actually captured, that's, that's, you know, lived out during the performance. And yeah, that is an important part of, of music as well. Um, but, you know, when you, when you think about the product of it, it really is a collection of, of, of frequency spectrum evolving over time. So that is true. And, you know, in, in a, if you want to say that, um, if you want to listen to a, a protein, you know, um, create, create music, um, you can do that rigorously. You, you can let the protein play its thing um, and follow its vibrations. And, and that is a performance the protein will do. Um, and, um, and, um, and that's um, kind of a similar thing that a human is, is performing. I see a question actually. Yeah, yeah. so Hyun Wang actually wrote something in the audience. Maybe, I don't know if you wanna add something to that. I know that he's a, he a performer. Um, he, he might wanna add something to that. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Next is... Uh, I have a, a second one, it's very quick. Yeah. You don't mind, uh, the second one is a, a technical question regarding optimality conditions. And uh, it's also related to uh, the question by Shouting, uh, the very first question. And uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed the uh, all the work that you did uh, with the spider webs. And uh, I was going to ask you, and uh, there, were, there was already some discussion about the optimality conditions, but uh, I, I believe that uh, 
the, the spider web configuration uh, has some optimality conditions uh, embedded on them. The question is how to understand them and uh, what is the objective and uh, how that is translated into the architecture that you get at uh, different scales. And uh, one thing that I was very excited, uh, we just wrote a paper here. I don't know if you can uh, read this, it just came out, is on uh, topology optimization of attention only uh, cable nets considering uh, finite deformations, okay? Yeah. And we dedicate this paper to Frey Otto, the great uh, engineer. You may not be able to see it, uh, but uh, we de here we dedicate it to him. And uh, what happened is finite deformations were crucial. And uh, essentially we investigated the 2D configurations. And then uh, Marcus, what we do is, uh, this is like the idea of compressed sensing. Uh, we have uh, millions or billions of uh, members, we, every possible member that can be used in the spider web and then uh, essentially our optimizer uh, is going to filter only a few from millions or billions. Uh, essentially at the end, uh, we only get a few and we were able to capture some of uh, the effects that uh, you showed for prey catching defects and so on. And uh, that's the, the question that I have. Have you thought about uh, exploring uh, some of the optimality conditions that could uh, inform the research itself and also the future of the research uh, especially topology optimization mm -hmm. under different objectives in different scales under different constraints. I think this would be fascinating. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And congrats on that paper. I, I, I'm going to take a look at this. Um, so, you know, the, the, the work I showed here today, mainly on the spider web, we, we didn't do any optimization at all. We, we just took the web and studied it in the way it comes to nature. But but as, as many of you know, we do we do a lot of work on optimization and finding optimization for composites, for instance, and also for the proteins. I didn't show this either. Um, um, but yeah, we um, for the web, we haven't optimized the web. Um, and it would be interesting because um, we we don't know what the objective functions are a lot of times for the web. But I mean, you, you the kind of reverse engineer, one of them that I, I showed was the prey catching. We know that um, the density and the relationship between the, the speed of the the prey, um, the size of the prey has an effect on, on, the, on the ability to catch. So there's some understanding we have. Um, but yeah, the objective functions are probably multi, um, multi-dimensional, right? Um, there isn't just one of them, but we don't know that yet. So in the spider web work, yeah, I mean, it would be amazing to do that. We haven't done this yet. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can collaborate on some of those things. Um, we, um, we, I, I've worked on some simple topology organization many years ago. I'm always fascinated by that. Um, we, we could we could look at that, um, but yeah, in other systems we've done a lot of optimization, like in like in sequence design for proteins, maximizing the stability of collagen or or lack of stability and, and things like this. And so we do that a lot of times for those. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, next is uh, Deepak Bakar Data. Hello, Professor Buehler. Um, I'm Deepakar Data. I'm an assistant professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology. So I have two questions. Uh, the first is you showed that male spider are one person in size of female spider. So I read that male and female spider, they create different kind of wave. The male one create very small one, but the female one create a bigger one because their purpose is different. The male one does create to catch the female and but the female one do to catch food and make babies. Uh, have you observed molecular level, uh, molecular structural difference of the wave created by male and female and if yes, what are the difference in mechanics or sound pattern of the yeah. two kind of wave? And mm -hmm. the second question is, uh, you showed the spider wave for electrode in batteries. Now in batteries, we have charging and discharging. So add atom goes inside and come out during charging and discharging. So constant kind of cycle. Mm -hmm. So have we, have we observed topological or the structural difference of wave when uh, atom goes going in and going out? Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, I don't, I don't have good answers to your questions, I'm afraid. But no, I mean, the, the question is, is a great one. We, we haven't studied that. Um, the webs we look at are, are all made by female spiders, um, but, but we, we should look at um, we should look at that. And I think it would be really interesting. And, and maybe I, don't, I would have to check the literature if somebody has done anything like this. Um, but you know, it's very likely that there are gonna be different kinds of silks and the way they are spun or, or drawn, you know, is gonna affect that. So I would expect there's some differences, but we haven't studied it, but that's a great, great suggestion. Uh, you know, the second question, I, I wasn't sure if I quite understand it, but I, um, you know, 
did are you were you talking about battery electrodes or were you talking about something else uh, you showed that uh, spider wave in batteries in one slide you showed that flow oh, battery no. is an electrode it so wasn't it wasn't a spider wave it was a um, it was a it was a carbon rich uh, well carbon based um, organic rich material made from shrimp it was okay. okay. made using http so that's a um, it's an experimental method we, we're using in the lab to um, basically come to the to the point where we can use other kinds of raw materials other than proteins and, and animals that process them and make them using DNA um, to kind of resemble the, the process from an engineering perspective in a, in a chemical plant. So we have a couple of projects on, on using sewage sludge, um, one on wood, where we're trying to come to the point where we can you know, add waste streams and, and use HTP to break the material into their building blocks, separate them, and then reassemble them um, without any living organism, right? So, so that's, and that's what we did for that electrode. And the, the disadvantage of our, disadvantage, if you wish, of this work is at this point is largely empirical. Um, so, you know, we don't have, we have some models, but um, I know actually did some modeling of the electrodes using quantum, uh, but, but it's not directed by that. You know, there's a lot of experimental discovery um, by playing with the conditions. Um, we're trying to come to the point where we can be more predictive, but it is sort of a very different approach than anything we've done before. And I, we got into that a couple of years ago um, to explore and we'll see where it takes us. But it is sort of a, a different thing that we usually do. A lot of times we, we're trying to be very systematic in the buildup of the material. And that's what proteins are really good for. But in the biomass stuff, we we really do some engineering, some you know some some, some good old engineering. You know, we we make something, we we see how it works, characterize the microstructure, tweak the parameter, trying to see what we can change the chemistry, and then and do some modeling. You know, but it's but it's a different approach. So it's a more traditional way of of doing chemical engineering, and process engineering, which which I, I enjoy doing, um, and and I think there's a potential there. But we'll see where it takes us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next is Anna from the panelists. Hi, Marcus. Thanks. Thanks yeah. a lot for a very inspiring talk. Um, I think you show uh, some really fascinating examples about how to actually merge different fields and, and make connections. So my, my question uh, is about um, what, what do you think are sort of the, the untapped disciplines um, maybe that you're thinking about of integrating into sort of you know mechanics and biology and architecture and music, um, so so beyond these in the future. Uh, good question. Yeah, I mean there are probably um, I would say there are probably um, any any kind of um, human expression that you know I'm fascinated by this idea that if you if you take um, um, and actually maybe uh, Glossier was asking about the performance. Let, let's say take that um, creative or intellectual ability of a human to make to create something. You know, it might be a performance, it might be a score. I've talked mainly about the scoring, but plus you talked about performance. You know, if that can if that can somehow solve an engineering problem or science problem that we haven't figured out so far, I think it's really breathtaking because you know a lot of times in science we 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 think of ourselves as as nonlinear, but actually it's very linear. You know, we we do an experiment we. Um, we try to test something and we make it right and so on for the theory. But you know, I'm really fascinated by, and this is where the work on proteins and music and, and you know, really is, go, is coming from, is to say, or can we discover something in fields that have nothing to do with science, but actually have inadvertently discovered scientific principles. And, and so I think I would say that any, any area of human expression, um, you know, I, when I did the, we published the um, coronavirus music and one thing that I have been surprised by, we got a lot of people that actually, um, some of you mentioned this in the introduction, that did actually created dance performances uh, with that. And, and that's an area, I've never actually worked on that. I have no you know, connection to that, but, but that's an area, for instance, I mean, I don't know. And actually, you know that, um, you know, one of our former um, collaborators on, um, you know, has worked, has created the dance performance of Elastin once that was, so, so that might be an area. So anything, I think any, anywhere, I think where the human brain is um, sort of exploring um, different ways of thinking and can we link that back to solving another problem? That's, that's, a, that's an interesting direction. Can I, can I have a comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, Marcos, uh, I was really inspired uh, by what you said and by uh, Anna's question. Uh, and uh, the, the, the comment uh, that uh, I would like to make also uh, relates to some of uh, the discussions we had uh, in uh, previous uh, webinars. And uh, also my first question to you, that uh, you are a human being, you have the two sides of your brain and you are using them both, you know? And uh, why more people don't do that? And uh, one of uh, the things that uh, we discussed before is because, for example, my biggest uh, disappointment in academia, especially, and I hope at MIT you guys are taking a different approach, but most universities I know, assistant professors, uh, for example, they are scared to death to take risks because they want to get tenure. And uh, that's not the best avenue to uh, <laughs> get tenure, you know, but uh, should that define uh, their research? You know, can we find uh, ways that where people could go and uh, take more risks and uh, maybe do uh, a kind of research uh, that uh, you just explained, right? Uh, uh, outside the box to try to advance science, technology. And this may look very weird uh, for some people because we are not trained to do that, right? Most people that uh, are listening to you here, including myself, only use the left side of our brain. But uh, we have both. So my question for you is the following, Marcus, and it may help people that are listening to this. I am sure that you have failed miserably many times. Can you tell people here in public many things you tried and you failed so that uh, you can motivate people to do this kind of uh, research, yeah. research? No, sure. I mean, I, well, you're right about the, um, you know, the risk and, and so on. I mean, you, you really got to time it right in your, in your career, you know, how, what you can do. And I, and I can tell you that, you know, a lot of times I've, you asked me earlier about giving, was it you or somebody else asked about giving talks to different audiences and you can fail miserably in getting a message across. And, and you know, I wouldn't say about being left out of the room, but basically people walking away thinking it's all nonsense. Um, and it can happen to both communities. So I think, you know, that, that is something that is fine. And actually the only way you can learn is, um, I mean, I, I take the approach, I say, you know, when, if I can't, if it's in my head and I, and I think I got it straight, it can change and I can make a better explanation, but but it really just has to motivate you to do a better job in explaining it, motivating it, um, connecting it. And so I think that's the thing to learn, but I would, you know, I mean, I would just say to everyone, you know, don't be afraid to to fail in, 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 in writing a paper and getting it rejected or giving a talk and, and having people leave the room and then okay, something <laughs> really happens. Um, I mean, I can say that, like I mentioned earlier, when I, when I gave my first talk at the Gordon conference at Aspen, I was the only person doing modeling. And I remember, I don't know if Anna, you were there. I think it was before you came, but, you know, and everyone in there was doing biology experiments and using cells and studying the gazillion pathways and how proteins are made. And, and I came in and I, I just wrote down Newton's laws and I said, okay, here's our result equations and we can predict the structure of elastin. And, and, and kind of people in the room were saying, yeah, yeah, it's not gonna work. And then, you know, a couple of years later, we with Tony and Anna, Anna was like, that was her PhD thesis. I think we made so much progress and now the people are actually taking it very seriously. And, you know, we, we're getting requests a lot of now, you know, can you study that mutation or this mutation? So, and, you know, if I would have taken that initial response and said, okay, I'm gonna run away, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So, so you have to sort of have that, that courage. And, and I, I, I think it's just like with anything, you have to train, right? You, you wanna run a marathon, I think you have to, run you know a mile first and two miles and ten i never ran a marathon but i, I imagine that's how you do it and so it's the same with this i mean you kind of go in, in small steps i think that's important um but yeah i'm i think that science should be about pushing the boundaries i also think that um you know with the students i mean you mentioned educational not not just the you know the, the research side of things but also um academia in general um you know, we, I think that it's really healthy for students, even if they don't use music or art to create science, that's, that's a whole different challenge, but it's, it's very healthy, of course, for every, for all the students to be exposed, especially, I think, you know, to see the, the boundaries. I mean, if you, if you work in um, really creative um, um, activities, there's no, there's no boundary, no physical law. You make the law, you create the constraint yourself. I mean, you, you're very powerful to do that in a sense. If you're a work in science, we are all bound by the physical laws. We can't make, we can't change them, right? And I think to see that and to see that difference is is really eye opening. And I and I think all the students um, should 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 experience that because it gives you an appreciation of what science is and what it is not. And so so yeah, I wish all the students would do that. I mean, MIT has a very strong focus on humanities and and arts. Um, 
I don't know how much the students really live that or if they just do it because it's required. Um, actually, I don't know if some of the undergrads can, can talk about that, but, um, but it is very healthy. We think it's important, yeah. It should be more of that, I think. Very inspiring, thank you. Um, next is uh, Zigang. Oh, hey, uh, Marcus, uh, thank you. Very intriguing talk. So one of the points you were making was a spider web can be regarded as a part of the body part of a spider itself. So in particular, you said uh, uh, it's a function, general function is to transmit this sound uh, for the spider to do something. It's a sensor, extended sensor. Right. Now, uh, yeah, so let's uh, make this more specific, uh, more, more, more concrete. Um, you, you begin to touch uh, this sound, then you translate to something human wants to hear. I guess that's not spider's concern. A human can hear whatever, it doesn't matter to spider. So this must mean something to spider. Mm. So do people study, so I'm thinking about an analogy of people of course study the neuron voltage signal to whether people are happy or people mm -hmm. are angry. So has some certainly has an important function to human. Now, do people study, study, draw this analogy web mm. as a neuron network, mm. right? Sound as voltage signal. Do people study sound signal, what it means to spider itself? Yeah, no, well, that is, I, do, I don't think it's been done very widely. Um, mm. we, we're trying to do that. We, we, we created, as a, so we recorded the spider's um, sounds basically and we uh. classified them using the this machine learning algorithm. And we were able to, using a classified generator to, to, to talk back to the spider. So we're able to, to kind of say words in the language of the spider. So we're trying to see whether we can affect the behavior of spiders using this way. Um, but so for example, let's have a concrete example. Uh, you must need to have a way to talk about behavior function. Right, exactly. According to a spider, for example, catch a fly. Maybe catch a fly is too complex. At least a sense uh, something. Right. Uh, how, how, how do you make this link from the sound that you can measure? and a spider can measure, presumably. Mm. Oh. And a function that's really important to the survival of the spider. Uh, how, how do you make that link? Okay, so, so the way you can visualize this is if you, if you imagine um, that the spider communicates um, with other spiders, let's say attract a, ma a mate. And so we'll actually create a particular signal that is called a mating signal to attract other. So it's like a, a bird calling mm -hmm. other birds, right? Oh. Um, and, and so we can record that. We can also, we've recorded um, various activities of spiders um, associated with activities. And, but we, we haven't, we have, we have, in my lab, we haven't gotten to the point yet where we can actually um, make the spider do things based on the sound we play back. But that's what we're trying to do. Um, so if this works, we can we can tell us we can we trick the spider basically to pretend here's a mate and the spider might come to the mate, but actually it's just us sitting there with a transducer, or we can we might have a, a transducer that mimics the uh, the spectrum of frequencies of a fly trapped in the in the web. The spider will think there's a fly, but it's actually not there. Right? So that's oh, a sort of behavior. Feel we like so biologists or whoever, I guess they to study this effectively, they need to measure the vibration itself. Exactly, right? no, that's what we do. Yeah, we did that. So Tomas- oh, How is the field like? Is this field totally open or, or people actually study this? Well, you, you attach a, a microphone, a, a sensor that, that, that measures mechanical waves. Yeah. So instead of measuring sound waves, you can measure the, the deflections of the web over time. And you can, you can measure that signal and it, when you listen to it, actually, I, I, don't, I didn't have it in the, in the talk, but I, I, I took it out because I had already 140 slides. But, I, but, I, but it, sounds like, um, it, sounds like, um, it sounds like a scratching of paper. You know? I don't know if you hear that. In the so it's like a scratching sound. And that's, it's just a bunch of signals in succession. And apparently, they mean something to the spider. Right? So they're unique uh, frequency spectra. Like you said to us, they don't mean anything. We listen to them, and it just sounds like like wind noise or, or you know some random random noise. But there's something in in that signal that the spider can understand. Thank you. 
So it's performance. You know, that's what you were saying earlier. It's, a, it's, it's the performance of the spider, uh, you know, performing in the web and, and you know, projecting the, uh, the web, uh, you know, it, its brain into the web and using it as a sensor. Um, interacting with the web. Great, thank you. Um, next is Yaakov. Oh, hey, Marcus, thank you for a great talk. You know, um, I'm a former CTO of Cabot, uh, actually making you know, all the different nanomaterials that go, you know, it's kind of a man-made version of the hard particles that go into you know, elastomers and plastics and try to make them you know, change different properties. And I'm now you know, expert in residence in Harvard, actually a student of Jingang studying you know, okay. soft materials. Uh, so the question I had was uh, more on kind of, you know, anytime anybody talks about you know, spider silk, right, they all talk about this, how great mechanical properties are. And yet when you look at industrial applications and you look at, you know, a couple of startups in the area around us, which would be like World by Nature or Mori, you know, mm -hmm. they do some processing of the, you know, sil you know, spider silk and then they, you know, what comes out kind of very valuable, but you know it's mostly around coatings, right? So people are figuring out how to create the coating for the fabric or the coating for drugs or the coating for food. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the whole thing started with like really great unique properties of, you know, and promise of mechanical properties, right? So I understand from one side, you can take the lessons, what you said, kind of, okay, there's a design principle. I can have this hard components and soft components. And, uh, and I think, you know, I look at, you know, Professor Teng Lee's talk about, uh, you know, kind of how do you process cellulose? And so it really is a question, kind of, we take with these natural materials that have all this unique functionality built in. And of course, you know, the nature optimized, you know, the strength, you know, to support and, and, and properties to support the spider, not humans, right? So when we think about, you know, bulk structures that, you know, humans want, it's very different, you know, scale and design. So can these principles be applied to actually human scale materials and properties and sizes that you know could be actually commercialized, or it's more like an inspirational you know design as opposed to practical application. Hmm, great question. Yeah, I think the um, you know they're kind of low hanging fruits um, you know in the in the protein world and, and using proteins to put them in our body, um, you know as replacement materials or you know as like you mentioned coatings on fruits so this is Benedetta Morelli's startup um uh, Mori and, and there's actually there's another startup um I don't know if you mentioned it Bolt Threat out in the out in the Bay Area I think they they make they use uh, uh, silk uh, materials actually make clothing from it and and they've also gotten into meat right so so you can um, you can make food right because food is protein as well and texture is important and the candela is important so there are a couple of companies startups that are in that area um, so I think we, you know, the low hanging, you know, applications are the, you know, the biological interfaces, um, and that's true for the food, and that's true for drugs and everything related to that. Um, you know, to make, um, uh, you know, go to the human scale, I think Bolt Threat is is a company that I don't know if you've seen those, but they they are making actual clothing from silk, uh, from spider silk, and they, um, uh, like I said, are also getting the food, and I think that actually uh, and leather as well. Um, um, sort of their angle is let's not make leather from animals because we don't want to kill animals to make leather or eat eat the animals. Let's um, you know let's let's eat food or use leather that's made synthetically. So they take that approach. So they're getting into the area of kind of um, you know real macroscopic human scale materials made from some of those ideas. Um, so there are companies like this, um, but you know I think in you know, in many ways, I, I, the way you look at it, I mean, I, I think that where many solutions aren't necessarily going to require us to use proteins, like if we want to make um, a new kind of concrete, a new kind of steel, I don't think we're going to use proteins for that, right? We might use silica and maybe a protein as a, as a weak face, right, to mimic what Nikra does or conch shells do. Um, but I, I think that building block replacement idea is going to be really important for a lot of applications, I think. Um, but yeah, I think there are companies out there that are, that are doing that. I'm, you know, I'm not, um, my lab's really interested in the, at this point at least, you know, in the fundamental scientific aspects of the mechanics of these webs and how they connect and how they're built and so on. But, um, but yeah, I think that's, you know, people have always talked about spider silk and, and the strength of steel and upscaling it. 
and and I and I'm very happy to see that actually some industrial applications at that scale are coming out that that seem to achieve some of those objectives. So the thing is happening. Great, thank you. Um, next is Jun Su Kim. Uh, hi, Professor Bueller. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm I'm working with um, Professor Sho right now as a PhD student. Uh, I have two questions, um, technical questions. Um, the one, the first one is about the, um, the vibration. So it reminds me a non-destructive test. So in, in iron mm -hmm. industry, in order to find the defects, they hammer it and record sound and track the defects mm -hmm. from the vibration. Right. Spider use that kind of strategy to find the prey, where's the prey like that. Right. So, and I, I saw the proteins. Can we uh, find defects of proteins using this kind of mechanism? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really hard to hammer it and it's also hard to record it because it is so small. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the one first question. The second question is about the synthesis of the proteins. So we, let's say we want to program the long protein chain to program the mechanical properties on demand. Uh, what's the, what would be, the, what's the current out of state to synthesize the proteins, mm. how, how the mass product mass rate or how easy it is, how, how expensive it is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, so the first question, um, you absolutely right. So the idea of having, um, you know, sending a signal into a structure and then measuring uh, what, what comes back or what is reflected or what's coming on the other side, is exactly what the spider does. And actually one of the one of the signals that you guys are asking about signals of there's mating and there's prey, but there's also a tapping mode. And, and what the spider is actually really doing is it's tapping the web. And, and presumably we, we think it's it's measuring what what comes back, right? So so it uses exactly this idea. Um, and so I think that's a that's a direction that's very, very interesting to do. Um, for the, the molecular scale, I I, I kind of was kind of hidden in the slides, but but we can actually do that. Um, so from a, I mean, first of all, from a, from a simulation, from a you know, theoretical perspective, we can do that. I mean, we, I, so, I, showed the, I showed the coronavirus spike protein attached to the human cell and detached, and it has a different spectrum, and you can, you can measure that. You can, you can hear it, uh, you can measure it, and you can even see it in the water waves, right? So it has, even though the difference is very subtle, um, because of the interaction of the waves, um, it, it creates a very different picture of the video at the end, so you can do that. And if you, um, if we're able to, um, you know, measure, you know, what what we're trying to do, and I, I actually had I had some we had some we had some discussions with some labs that are that is specialized in in actuating matter at ultra small scales with very high frequencies, um, and to basically experimentally do what we're doing in the simulation. Okay, and 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 I think that ability from a technological point of view is at this point incipient. I mean, it's very in a very new field because actuation usually is at a bigger scale. And then as you go to smaller scale, it looks more difficult. But I think the technology is getting there. And, and, I th and uh, there I've, I'm in discussions with, some, with a lab actually that has some really amazing tools to, to get to that point and then measure the response. And so if you're able to excite uh, a tissue and measure the frequency of the response, uh, you can actually hear or, or see or analyze the mutations because we know that very small molecular changes or mutations have a very different uh, frequency response. We know that from all these proteins we've analyzed, we have we've analyzed unknown proteins. So we have many examples where we have a mutation, a disease protein, a healthy protein, and uh, they're gonna have a different response. And so we, we can hear them, we can see them. So if we're able to do that experimentally, we can definitely do that. So that's actually a, an area where we, um, we are we're actively researching and whether we can use diagnosis. So using um, um, using any and for the diagnosis you need a mechanics model because without the without without having a model you don't know what you're measuring. That's right? so you're just measuring something. Yeah. So you need a model of, that that links your response to some structure. So that's where mechanics comes in. So we, we're getting there in terms of the theory, uh, but we need experimental techniques still to get better to do that. The other area is actually therapy. And, uh, and so, you know, that for, um, you know, there's, a, there's an approach, of course, of, of 
um, you know, of getting rid of uh, gallbladder stones, I think using, using ultra ultrasound and, and basically use you excite the certain modes of a, of a, of a piece of rock in your body um, and you, you're trying to break it, right? So they have a, um, a, a resonance catastrophe, I think they call it. Um, or like, you know, the, the wine glass um, that the opera singer can make break, right? So you can do the same idea, you know, you can do that medicine today already for, for gallbladder and other kind of things. Um, and so, you know, if we're able to inject very high fidelity signals and very localized space, actually, um, we're gonna be able to do that for proteins as well. And so what you can do with this, um, because we know which modes excite which motion of the protein. So Zhao actually, Zhao, I'm seeing Zhao, he, he did all the calculations, right? So you can, you can actually drive unfolding of the protein by exciting the right modes, right? So if you think about that, you know, that frequency spectrum, you can play all the modes, but that's not necessary. It might actually be counterproductive. You wanna, you wanna excite the modes that are gonna destabilize the protein. And, and that actually is, is very, very exciting. And, and I hope that someone will figure it out. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do it, but if anyone in the world can do it, I think that would be amazing because it's a, it's a highly new way of, 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 of actually dealing with matter. In this case, breaking matter, right? And so since we're all, well, at least I'm very interested in fracture, um, I'm always trying to find new ways of breaking things. And, you know, mode one, mode two is not, and mode three is not the only way of breaking things. At the nanoscale, we're going to have to be very creative. And, and I think these, these modal excitations are a very powerful way to do that. So I think we'll, we'll get there ultimately. But yeah, it, it needs, it, it is exactly what, what, you're, what you're saying. You, you could use that to, to target um, therapeutically, you know, specific types of proteins. So for instance, in the, in the COVID case, if, you were able to um, excite the modes that um, that are what's associated with the attachment of the spike protein with the um, with the virus. Um, that would be that would be a big deal. Um, so yeah. Uh, the second question was the production of the proteins synthetically. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> artificially, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the um, making a protein is possible, but very painful a lot of times, okay? And, and I think that's the lesson that we, we learned. I mentioned earlier, I think in the beginning, Zegan was asking me about my collaboration with David, you know, um, and for, for me and all the students and everyone, you know, to know how to make a protein is really important because it, so it makes you appreciate, first of all, what kind of proteins can you make? Uh, not everything can be made with the same method. So there's chemical synthesis methods. And you can imagine this really being like, like a machine, like a printer, and you send the sequence uh -huh. through and then it makes that, right? And it, it works well for small proteins. But if you want to make a protein that's bigger, most proteins in the human body and, and the ones used in silk are, are very long, actually. Uh, you can't make with these techniques, so you have to resort to other methods. You can use, um, uh, you can use other hosts, like bacteria, and kind of trick them to make uh -huh. you know, something different than they're supposed to make. Like E. coli, you can make them make a bunch of protein that you want them to make. And, and that's something that doesn't work always because they are organisms and they don't like to do anything. Even though you tell them to do it, they might just say, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in making that silk protein today or tomorrow or any, any time. So, so there are certain proteins that work and don't. And, and I think, and that's a whole field, you know, of bioengineering synthesis that, yeah. that that's where there's a lot of expertise, but also a lot of unknowns, I would say. Um, and then, um, but even if you can do that, I think, let's say you have a reactor with, you know, a, quadrillion E. coli and then make the perfect silk. Um, the biggest issue actually is then to make that stuff you made into a real material, right? And so a lot of people forget about that. You know, when you when you have um, when you make a drug, it's enough to make the protein or the drug, the antibody. But if you're dealing with materials, like we all interested in building things like a web or a food coating, you're gonna have to assemble these proteins. And that's really the hardest part. I think even if you can make it, how do you make the protein into a network? That looks like spider silk, or looks like collagen, or looks like something else. And so I think the you know the human body, or the animal, or the plant has not just a making of a protein as a machinery. It also has a lot of chaperones, not not just literal chaperones, but but you know other cells or other organisms or other proteins that work together to actually build the stuff that they make. And yeah. and you know I mean the reason why we're interested in silk is because actually it's a very simple system, right? It has it's a simple protein, it's very repetitive. Um, and it also has um, some really interesting, um, you know, because the protein is outside the body, like we were saying, um, you can study it more easily. If you were to study, I mean, we also study collagen, but it's usually made inside the body. And you can't watch the, the cells make protein very easily and see it. 
the spider web is something you can see with your eyes and you can scan it and watch it. So it's actually a system that we can begin to explain. You know, we can understand a little bit better how it's built. But as you know, as you know from the talk and from you know, knowing in the literature what's out there, even a system like SpiderWeb, which is actually reasonably simple, is still not understood. So we have a lot long way to go for the scientists to figure out how it's all done. But, but yeah, I, I would say the assembly is really key. But yeah, it can be. I mean, you, you can have a protein that, um, like a lot of, see, when we made, when we designed the proteins using the music approach, and we, we had the score, we, we had a protein, and we had it simulated, we knew it's stable. Um, we, on the experimental side, needed to work a lot on actually finding a host that can make that protein, because it's a protein that nature has not invented. It's not even close to anything nature has ever seen. So you sort of you know, it's like going to a factory and asking them to build a new kind of car that they've never built. So they're gonna, they're not sure if they can make that car, right? Or that engine or that I don't know, machinery or that computer. So you're kind of thinking about the cells as a machine or a factory and, and they're not gonna be able to build anything you want, but, but the, 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 that science and that engineering has advanced a lot. So you can make a lot of stuff now, but it might be complicated. You might have to shop around, like, you know, find the right host. And I, when I first got into this, I thought, oh, you just put a DNA in a cell or in a microbe and they're gonna make it for you. Actually, it's not that simple, right? So, so there's a lot of biology that goes in and you have to find the right holes and so on. But yeah, you can do it. So we're, like for that protein we made, um, we call it sequence A and B and C. We didn't give it a name yet. And uh, we don't know what it does. We, just, we keep it in the tube, we've analyzed it a little bit, but we don't, because we don't know what the protein does, right? So that's yeah. quite interesting too. Um, but yeah, we, um, we found a way to make it, but it's not, not easy. No, it's not always that easy. I mean, people don't, I mean, when you have a, you read a paper and how people made a protein, they're not going to, well, maybe they'll talk about it, but it sounds like such an easy thing. Yeah, we've made that protein. It's like we made that perfect nanotube battery and it works fine. But actually, yeah, you know, 99% of the time it doesn't work. So there's, there's a lot of really, there's a, it's very hard to do. And, and you also don't necessarily get high purity. That's the other thing that, you know, in that field. You might get the protein, but it's maybe 0.1%. The rest is garbage. You know, it might be unfolded protein. It might be, you know, some other molecules. So you want to make sure you have high purity, high concentration. And so that is all really difficult. Yeah. So I think it's hard. That's why, you know, if you can work, if you have a, a system like a spider that remakes that protein, um, one way could be to basically create a spider farm, right? To, to use the spider yeah. to a bunch of protein. Um, but that's that's part of the technology. And I think the, those companies that I mentioned, that's what that's what they're figuring out. You know, they're finding the optimal host to make you know artificial meat or artificial leather, and they 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 cross. There's a lot of engineering involved in, in trying to do that. I mean, beyond the discovery of the protein, you then have to figure out how do you make it efficiently and, and cost effective and all these things. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing knowledge. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next is uh, Tian Tang. Uh, thank you, Grace, and thank you, Marcus. Best fascinating talk, as always. Um, I want to ask two questions. Uh, the first is, um, from mechanics point of view, I wonder what is the difference between a spider web without spider on it and a spider web with spiders on it? Uh, you showed a picture with a 3D uh, uh, spider web with a lot of spiders on it, and one thing that jumped into my mind was, oh, this is the composite materials with, with the spiders being the fillers and, and, and maybe active fillers. So I'm yeah. just wondering, uh, what, what's your thought on that? And, yeah, and second yeah. question, uh, sorry, if I... Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, uh, the second question is, you touched upon the coronavirus towards the end and the spectrum uh, associated with the, with the coronavirus binding to human cell. So it's, it's very interesting. I, I wonder if uh, you could share your thoughts on how we might use audio or video to visualize the binding of proteins to, to different cells. I, I'm really curious because we, we still know very little about the coronavirus. Uh, people initially thought it's attacking the lung, uh, but then people think it might be attacking other organs in the human body. So I was just wondering, if, if uh, how we model the binding of protein to different cells and how we might be able to capture it using audio or video. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I mean, the first question, the, um, yeah, honestly, I don't know how the mechanics is gonna be affected by the spider in the web or not. I just, we have never looked at that. I mean, we, we, um, we, we actually have, we actually, I didn't show this, but we built 
we have the spider build a web in a frame that, that has a, a cut in it. So we can actually take the real spider web and pull it. We, I didn't show that, but some of the summer students last summer um, have done that. Um, but the spider was either dead or not in the web anymore. So, I mean, we, can, we can't really know, but it would be interesting to see. I, I would suspect it has very little effect because it's local. It, it sits locally on a couple of strands where the deformation is going to be, for the whole web, it's going to be global, right? So, so I don't think the effect would be strong. If you have a lot of spiders, like the, the, the baby spiders I've shown in the, when they hatch, um, yeah, that might have a stronger effect. And, um, and that might be interesting to study. I, I just don't know. Um, I don't know. We haven't studied. That was an, 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 an in nature observation. So it was not something, well, we have spider babies in the lab too. Isabella always talks about them because everyone gets a little worried when we have a lot of spiders in the building. But, um, but, um, but yeah, we, but we haven't studied them yet. Um, but um, yeah. So you had a, a second question about the binding. So the binding, you know, the, we, we, the work we're doing on, 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 co on COVID. Um, spike protein and the, and, the, and the interaction with other proteins in the human cell is really at a scale of, of just the receptor and the protein. It's not um, you know, for different kinds of cells or at the organ level, we, we don't know. That's something, it's nothing, nothing we've looked at, but there's gonna be an effect of that. Um, and I think once we understand to what receptors they can bind, um, we're gonna be able to understand you know, what kind of organs they might infect, but that's way beyond something that I would do. I, we're not in that in the field, but, but we, we are looking at, at, at the mechanics of the binding of receptors that have been shown to be um, active sites for the protein to attach. And, and that's a mechanical process, right? So it's like, and I think actually, I think Hua Jen Gaon has talked, I think he talked a little bit about that from a different perspective, but the, you know, the infection is a mechanical process. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's mechanics at work. You know, there's a punctuation, there's a fracture, um, th there's a binding, which is an adhesion problem, the inverse of fracturing. And, and so there's gonna, be, there's gonna be some really interesting relationships. And, and what we have found is that, um, you know, that, that hasn't been explored, um, but, but we have a paper forthcoming very soon with one of my students um, that I think will shed some light on that actually, and, and, and actually make the connection to some um, epidemiological measures. In other words, connecting the mechanics to the, the global perspective of the disease for different coronaviruses. So I, I can't say much more than that because otherwise I'm, we have to finish the paper and submit it. But, um, but yeah, that's, it is a very exciting area, I think, for mechanics. You know, when I, when I was a PhD student at that time, it was really the first time that people became interested in applying mechanics to biology. And, and I remember Jimmy had this program at NSF and then others got involved in this and then Glossier had a program there. So it's a really exciting time where um, began to apply mechanics to biology, and and it's really always kept me really excited since then. I think it's more true more than ever actually to to look at that because you know, the mechanics pro provides a very clean, a very vigorous, clean description of the physics of what's going on, um, the mechanism, and 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 the, the actual mechanics of how the things deform and how they break and how they assemble. And it's really elementary to biology. It's biology is just one giant machine. It's just very complicated, right? And so we just have to keep working hard on, on dissecting it into little pieces. But, but yeah, I think it's, it's better than ever. And one reason it's better than ever actually is that we have a lot of methods now that allow data-driven approaches, like I've shown a lot. Of, so if we wanted to understand the language of proteins by studying that language, maybe we could do it. I don't know. We could maybe spend, maybe the human brain wouldn't be able to comprehend that. But uh, building an artificial neural network, we can design it so that it can actually capture these languages. So we can do better, just like we can do better, be better materials in nature, we can also build a better brain than nature. Not for everything humans can do, but it can be specialized for certain things. And so that's, that's something also for mechanics, I think, um, very exciting. So next, I, I think I, I'll give a talk actually next week at the NAE, um, you know, some, of you might, some of you might've seen it on Twitter on, on machine learning and mechanics, and I'll talk a lot more about that in, in, that, in that talk. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Zhao. Okay. Oh, hi. Uh, this is Zhao Qin uh, in the Civil and Environmental Department in Syracuse University. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for giving the fa fascinating uh, talk, and thank you, Grace, for uh, coordinating it. So I'm really glad to see that uh, the 3D uh, spider web structure gets be used to apply to the mechanical test, and then you study the mechanical inside of it. So one question I have uh, is 
actually, so um, the, the, the connectivity of the spider web is also uh, interesting besides the density distribution. So I'm wondering uh, if you uh, and uh, Isabel have studied uh, how the connectivity and uh, its distribution affect uh, the mechanics, including toughness and uh, defect tolerance. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, we, we have looked at, um, you know, in, in one of the papers that we, like I said, we just submitted, we looked at, you know, different parameters beyond density, uh, about connectivity and orientation and angles, and, um, and the number of connections made across uh, different cells. So we have that as a, as, a, as a feature, which really expands the description, you know, into the microstructure significantly beyond just density. Um, but, but we haven't looked at how the variation of density might affect the web, right? So, so you're going to have a web and there's going to be a gradient of all these different parameters and how that affects it as a composite, we don't know. But that's, that's a really interesting direction, yeah. I, you know, I should send so much, actually, Zhao was, I think you, you were on the photo earlier. Um, Zhao was actually in the lab when we got the first spider, right? So you were there when we built the first scanning setup and everything. Yeah, I still remember the days yeah. of scanning the lab in the dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so it was, it was quite, quite, quite amazing. You know, I think it's, it's such an interesting world. I mean, you get really you know, like drawn into that and, and you begin to, in the beginning, you just see a cobweb and then you begin to see all these other things in there and you begin to see all these other features, all the things we talked about in the, in the, in the discussion. It's a fascinating field, yeah. No, but yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, we should actually, what we should do, we should map the, the microstructural parameter um, over the web and then and then see how that those that next level of hierarchy is, is in, impacting the mechanics. I'm sure there's an effect. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Um, I think we got a, a, a comment from Hume Wan from before. Wong. Okay, maybe it's blocked. And then um, uh, Amir Su uh, uh, Amir Suhail uh, from the chat. Yeah, he's he's here. Hello. Yes. Uh, actually, yeah, I am Amir. I am from Institute of Mathematical Science, a uh, graduate student. Chennai, India. So my question is like, how does the structure of spider web changes depending upon the nature of food prey? Like you did some experiment and uh, like how much does it change depending upon the nature of prey? And also are there any like dynamical models like in which we can model uh, this, uh, which involves the breaking and forming of links? Like can we model the uh, prey and the spider as and some active particles and uh, like, can we, are there any studies? Really? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, the food, the food actually, we, we know um, that the, the food and actually also the environment, the temperature and how hungry they are, everything affects it. We have not studied it systematically. I know that our collaborator, Tomas Sarasino, who I mentioned a few times, um, I think they looked at that uh, to some degree, um, but it's, it's one of these other parameters. I mean, for, for us, we, we're gonna have to, we, we have been trying to you know, pick a couple of parameters that we're really interested in and we can systematically vary. Um, I mean, you can, you can feed, I guess you can feed different species of flies and see how it affects it. We just haven't done it yet, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of room for, I mean, there's a lot of room for other, many other labs around the world to do that. It's, if it's interesting and if it's fundable, I mean, that's, 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 that's hard to do sometimes, but um, definitely, uh, definitely, I know it affects it. Um, the, the spider will sort of extend its organism, its, its, its body, depending on what it's, what it needs. And, and um, I, I've heard anecdotally that the hungrier the spider is, the quicker the web is built. Um, so, so there's an effect. Um, and so, yeah, I know that this has been explored at least conceptually to some degree. Um, the, um, the, model, the model is not dynamic. I mean, it doesn't allow for filaments to form and re, uh, break and reform. It's not built, it's not built like this. Um, once, the, once the strand breaks, they break. But it could be done. You know, you know we've done a lot of models of using coarse grain descriptions of polymers and they they usually oftentimes you know afford, them, afford themselves to have breaking and reforming of bonds so that can be done. It's just in the, in the spider web model we haven't done it yet. I think Huang is back. Huang? Do you wanna did you have anything to, I think you added a comment earlier. Just want to make sure I got you from before. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it was a, it was a, I know. So uh, Hyun Won and I actually are working together on, um, on um, for him to, um, to perform the, um, the, the COVID-19 representation using a single violin, which, which is very difficult because as, we, as you've seen, the complexity allows, actually means that we have um, many, many melodic lines in a weaving. Um, but so we've talked about that in my email, yeah. So the, the tuning is uh, 440 hertz tuning. Um, and I know you, you tuned your violin differently when you performed it, but, um, um, but yeah, we used um, 440 hertz tuning for the, for, the, for the music, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, next is Jiao Wei Yang, are you? Okay. Yes, yes, just coming. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Bueller. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. It really opened a new world. But I have uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, I see the spider web just like a polymer network of a hydro or elastomer. It's a random distribution of those polymer chains. But we know those um, double net hydro has a very high mechanical properties, exceptional uh, toughness. So, um, do you think you can have uh, more, um, like two or more species of spiders that can raise together oh. and create different webs that are interpenetrating together to increase those um, uh, mechanical property of overall those uh, webs? Yes, yeah, so I mean, by the way, to the first point, I mean, the, the web, it might look random. It's, it's not random, actually. You know, there's structure. I mean, you've seen that in the scans, you've seen it in some of the analysis. So there's some regions that are amorphous, um, and there's some regions that aren't, you know, they're more crystalline. So there's actually structure in it. But, but your second question is, uh, you know, really amazing actually. And um, I've shown webs built by a single spider, but there are um, obviously different species of spiders. Some of these um, species live in colonies. Can you imagine like ants? So now they're building a web together, right? And so they, they're called social spiders. They, they, they live in a group and they each built the web together like bees, you know, and these kind of insects. So there are spiders like this, and they also are um, semi-social spiders that build territorial, but they build them, build their webs in kind of different corners, kind of like a village, right? a spider village where spider A builds a web in that corner, another one in that corner. Um, and so there are these, these kinds of different things. And there also are experiments that I know that Tomas did on, on using a web that's been built, that's had, that was built already, and then putting a different species of spider in that web to have it built a secondary web on top of that or within it, right, penetrating the old web. And so, so that also has been done. So there's a lot of different things one can try. Um, and yeah, so the experiment where you take an old web and you put a new web, a new spider in it, that's something that maybe doesn't occur a lot in nature, but we can do it in a lab. Um, but there are these social spiders or semi-social social spiders that actually live in groups. So most spiders are territorial, right? So they will kill each other. They will not live in a group because only one will survive. Um, um, but um, that's a good thing because otherwise in your basement you might have, I don't know, a lot of spiders. So they are, they're, they're trying to have a ter territory worked out for them. But yeah, but there are these really, and I think actually, I think that's, you know, I just, I just wish I had more time in the day because, and, and more labs and more, I don't know, spiders and stuff because it, it's fascinating to study how these webs look like um, and how they, how they perform mechanically, what kind of structures they have. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, so there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of really interesting things once you get into different species of spiders. And I mean, a couple of years ago, um, Anna, Anna actually worked on a paper, I don't know if Anna is still here, but I think she left, um, yeah, I think she left, but um, the, she looked at um, just the mechanical signatures of many different species of spiders and, and mapping these mechanical signatures to different ecological niches. So that's just a single strand, not the web. And, and there's just an enormous space where you can kind of begin to understand how the mechanics of the single filaments meet certain ecological requirements that the, the spider has. And I think something like that is also true for the entire web itself. So there's a, there's a big space out there. Oh, thank you for the, for the first question. Uh, I forget to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a former PhD, PhD student in the Gunsort lab. I'm now in uh, MIT Professor Langer and the uh, Anderson lab. So, okay, great. Yeah. So, um, here's my uh, second question um, regarding to the uh, coronavirus uh, music. So, um, we know coronavirus uh, will bind to the receptor on the epithelium cells in the lungs, then they can enter the cells. So, do you have um, the music or those? Uh, 
receptor proteins as well, so that if you put those uh, you know coronavirus protein music and those receptor music together, what uh, what will happen? Is that um, you know create a successful linking that allows the virus go inside or not? And furthermore, if we have antibodies, antibody can neutralize the virus, which means the music signal, uh, you know, music may change. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, those stuff? Yeah, we're trying, we're trying to actually, the, the work on, on AI is trying to come up with a, an antibody design um, to prevent the, the, the binding from happening, right? or, or bind it to another molecule, prevent the infection in the human cell. But, but so that's something we're doing, uh, and we we're actually doing this with IBM uh, and, and a, a team at MIT on, on that. So um, we, we hope we can do something there. Um, and that's a that's really um that's actually a protein design problem, but it's also a mechanics problem because you you need to find a, an adhesive that's stronger as an adhesive than the human cell. Right? So so that's that's the problem statement, um, and and it's exciting. So so we're doing that um, that with these some of the methods I, I talked about. Um, the um, regarding the uh, the bindings so that we have, yeah, I, I played a little bit of the uh, COVID spike protein um, uh, music, which which a lot of uh, you know a lot of people become very fascinated with. Um, but but also we have a we also have a, a, an equivalent to that of the the binding moment actually, and and I and I you know we we have a, a music representation of the protein binding to the human cell, and um, and you can also find that on, on SoundCloud or if you Google it, you'll find it somewhere. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I think we just take two more people. Um, Ting, Lee, I, did you have a question? I think I saw you. Question. I think he's muted. Uh, not really. I've been enjoying the discussion uh, very much, and especially toward the end part of the of the discussion phase. That's typically when we have uh, even more in depth discussions. Um, Maybe some follow-up uh, um, uh, comment uh, related to what Glossio and also Gigon mentioned. And Marcus, I think your response was, uh, was great. And uh, uh, I think we also have a musician, Kian Wang, here. <laughs> so uh, related to what Glossio mentioned uh, or asked previously um, in terms of its music playing, um, you know, during the pandemic, the uh, many musicians they uh, offered this uh, live event, like a uh, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, played the live event in his home studio. I, I enjoyed a lot. And uh, if you think carefully about those, it's uh, it's live performance. Given the current situation ongoing, probably the next time uh, when we really can sit in to see the live performance will be still uh, up in the air. But uh, you can still enjoy all this great music performance, and and those music performances are converted into zeros and ones from his home studio and transmitted through internet to my TV. And what exactly we are enjoying is just those one and the zeros, uh, right? <laughs> I mean that's 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 a hard truth, right? I, I mean. Uh, there are already algorithms over there that try to mimic the uh, styles of uh, great composers in the history. Uh, I don't quite remember those names, either Bach or Tchaikovsky. And they, 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 the algorithm, they can compose music and let the uh, audience to listen and uh, ask them to guess uh, whose music it is. And many people are actually tricked, you know, they, they think, okay, this is Bach, and uh, probably I don't know what's the name, but it's definitely Bach style. So like Glossio asked about this, you know, the differences di between different players of the same piece of music. I mean, I would argue probably the algorithm will be powerful enough in the future that can capture those differences and uh, make different performance of the same music with different styles. W which one do you want? Do you want a Yo-Yo Ma or you want another one <laughs> playing the, the same piece? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, Max is uh, another expert on, on this, so that's uh, that's my comment. I mean, future is really hard to predict, but uh, I mean, human being has always been on top of uh, many things, coming up with different creative ideas. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> 
Thank you for the wonderful talk. That's a great, that's a great comment. Yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to, I want to add to the, the zeros and ones. I think one, one really big problem, in addition to, you know, is that the solution actually is, is a really, um, you know, when you, when you, when you stream, um, when you listen to live performance in a room, and you, you, you have the, the analog signal basically hitting your ear. It's very different than. And, and a, a digitized um, version, especially one that's streamed on the internet, and that's very painful for, for me a lot of times because, you know, even the, even a high quality streaming service will still, you know, take a lot of the the, the the details away, and 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 so it's really hard nowadays actually to um, get access. I mean, you can get it, but it's it's quite pricey um, to get access to really you know high quality um, you know audio recordings because all the all the streaming is done, you know, it takes away a lot of the quality. That doesn't bother most people, but that's that, that's one comment I want to make. And so, you know, but but it is okay. I think, um, you know, the 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 human performance and you know, what that means. That's that's a you know, it's a very long, much longer discussion that we can have here. But um, I mentioned earlier when you the human performance of of our hands and or you know, hands basically or mouth or you know voice. Um, it's just one performance, but right? you can also think about the, the the protein performing itself, right? Because it's it's following the laws of physics and the Brownian motion and its vibrations, and and that's an equally relevant performance, right? So so there's sort of different different ways to look at that. But I mean, commonly when you think of a performance, you don't think of a protein performing or a spider web performing itself, but but it is another performance. I mean, there are a lot of people interested in. You know, in measuring the, um, you know, the, the the data generated by living organisms, and then and including at MIT, some of my colleagues are working on forests and you know collecting data from forests and listening to them, and it's it's just another kind of performance. So I'm what I, well, what I'm trying to say with this long-winded answer, it doesn't have to be a human performing. It can be other things in nature performing, and it could even be um, quantum mechanics performing or Newtonian mechanics performing, and you know. Humans are very, um, you know, ignorant sometimes of what we think is a performance or not. But no, I think I think there's there's just yeah. You make a great point. But I mean, it's great that um, we have access to all of these um, to Zoom, right? I mean, we could be connected in that way. I mean, I, I remember um, before that. I think before we used Zoom, we had WebEx, and it was a terrible platform. Sorry, maybe <laughs> delete that from the YouTube. I don't want to no, but. Um, you know, I actually have been on a WebEx call the other day and it just doesn't just work as well as Zoom. So it made a big difference in how you can actually communicate. So it's, so it's great. And people have time. You were saying, you know, people before that didn't have time to listen to you, your man, live performing. Now they have finally have time maybe to do that. So it's a good thing too. Great, thank you. I think one, one last question, um, um, uh, Jason. Okay, hi. Um, thank you for the talk, uh, Professor Bueller. I'm a PhD student under Jigong, and, and I just have one question. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you're talking about the mechanical properties of silk, and that silk is um, has an amazing combination of stretchability and strength, and this is achieved by its uh, hierarchical structure. But it, it seems to be just a, a composite of hard and soft domains. My question then is, um, if we know the structure and we know the uh, properties of the hard and soft domains, um, could we assemble a synthetic spider silk with different materials at a very different uh, size scale? Mm -hmm. like does, it doesn't need to be molecular scale using proteins. I could use anything. Yeah. Or I think is so. that true? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we, we've tried that in a couple other systems, not, not the silk, but you know, to, you know, build um, macroscopic, you know, equivalents in 3D printing of materials that actually Grace has worked with all over the conch shells, right? You know, to scale up the nano steel and make behavior and make them accessible and, you know, mimic those properties. So, yeah, I think that's a very interesting direction. Not, not just the same, but the scaling it up. You can see it better. I mean, like we when we print the webs, we, we print them much bigger than a natural web. But you can you can actually do a tensile experiment or a compression experiment, um, you know, with a piece of brick putting on the web. You can do compression and you can measure it more easily. And 
you know, so yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea. I think it's a great idea. I, yeah, I, I was I, actually, well, yeah. I, was, I was reading papers about like uh, a synthetic nacre and other yeah, right. uh, bio-inspired composites. And if you look at the size, they don't make it the same size as the biological. No, no. Well, so I think what I, what I think is really important, actually, when, when we got into, we, I didn't talk a lot about the composite work today, but when we got into this, I was really interested in creating a clean model of composites. But what I was trying to say, so we have models, computational models that can describe mechanics, spectrum mechanics and composite very well, but then you have people doing, creating a composite at the nano scale that, you know, you have to do the TM imaging and it's really a lot of uncertainty about how you collect the data and what fields you get. So we were thinking, you know, can we scale it up so you can much more easily image it, but create really models. And that's a lot of the work that we did with Leon in the beginning and, and others in my lab. I, again, I didn't show a lot of, I shared one little slide on this, but was the idea that, you know, let's study systematically how stiffness ratios affect the, the toughness and the stress field on the L1 crack. And, and that has had not been done. And I, and I actually never knew why, because, you know, people jump to the really complicated system and try to mimic the nanoscale but we didn't really look at the mechanics and the fracture mechanics of how slight changes of the organization of stiff and soft components affect the, the properties. And so we've been trying to do some of that because I think it's a, um, there's a lot to learn, I think, from, from these systems. I think it's a great direction to do that, yeah. It's like building a clever experiment. You know, you don't have to, you, you, you have to choose the right experiment to, to, to do, and, and then you can learn from that, right? So you don't have to make the most complicated experiment or simulation. You have to pick the right one and learn what you want to learn. Great, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bueller. Um, I think we're gonna end here with the webinar. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much for the fascinating talk and thank you to the panelists and also the audience for the great questions. And of course, thank you to the email editors for organizing and hosting this webinar. And I'll maybe I'll hand it back to uh, Tsugang for any final thoughts. Oh, just one thing. Thank you, Grace. Uh, this is a Grace faculty from uh, uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Such a gracious uh, host. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, right. All right. Let's end here. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.